Welcome, everybody, to the book club on Facing Codependence by Pia Melody. And tonight we have Healthy Love and James. Hey, guys. Hi, everyone. So let's see here if people are finding their way. We have our misery cowboy. Yes, C. Finn, JJFX, Sam, Kevin. Hey, yeah. Welcome, welcome. So, okay, I have, so I have my notes on this book. I haven't posted them yet to my website. I still need to clean them up. Um, but I guess, is there anything that you guys want to add before we kind of get into that? Do you want to share, James, how you hate it and love the book at the same time? I didn't hate it. It, it, it brings up a lot of, uh, like, feelings of, um, like, aha moments or oh crap moments where you you read the the text and then you're like wait that's that sounds a lot like me and you start realizing things that you never knew before and it's kind of it's kind of scary it's a lot to take just like the last pm melody book so yeah i guess it's to be expected I was going to quit book club if Dana was saying that we have another PM. <laughs> I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> I don't think she has any. Wait, she has one more, I think. I think she might have one more. Yeah. We've read three. Yes. Uh, yeah. And they're all fantastic, but she's she just does such a great job, I think, of really kind of laying this stuff out. And it can be really triggering because she's so yeah. concise with how she hits every single point and you're like like you were saying james you're like wow i yikes yeah i see a lot of myself like, yeah. in that like super but, details where it's yeah it's, uh, it's freaky how how um on point she is yes i agree and she says even at the end of the book which i really liked she said you know um recovery like when all of this stuff starts coming up and we start really um, understanding our past and how our past impacts the present and all of that. She says the pain of recovery can be intense, but it's totally worth it. Mm -hmm. um, the pain of going back to the way we were is just, it means to live an unbearable life. And, right. and she's made some comment about, you know, uh, when your demons start surfacing, you're better off trying to snuggle with them or else they're going to bite you on the butt. And I really like that because a lot of the stuff, it's like we really do need to get. It needs to come up. It, we, it needs to come up and we need to just get, get a handle on it. So it's not yeah. controlling our lives and yeah. subconscious ways. But and I otherwise, was, you're just you're kind of pushing them to the side and it, it, it just it just sits there. Right. And, and I think she'd mentioned in the one of the other books, like there is no healthy relationship possible if a person's got all of this unresolved dysfunction. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you're not in reality, right? And you're and you're yeah. you're seeing the fantasy of the other person. You're seeing the fantasy of the relationship. If we've got our own, um, and she talks. Let me get my notes. She talks about this how codependency is. She calls it a disease of immaturity. Mm -hmm. Which, ouch. Um, yeah, no, right. Yeah. I, like it, no, I actually like it better because if someone tells me I'm immature, I feel like I can actually learn and mature. I, yeah. I rather I rather deal with you know my maturity issue like my development issue than my psychological issue to be honest with you that's better <laughs> yeah well and I think it's kind of kind of both I mean mm -hmm. and but yeah I was you know it's a little like it kind of takes you back a little bit because it can be a little offensive like what do you mean I'm immature <laughs> especially if yeah. if I think of a person's been if they haven't been in the role of more of like the dependent codependent. Like as I was going through this book, I'm like, I am the anti-dependent and I've always been fiercely independent, held my own, um, you know, and, and so it was like, I, I never saw myself as immature. If anything, I was always the young adult, you know, yeah. um, even at a really young age. And so, but I get it now because even that over, that that sense of like anti-dependence and being overly mature for your age is still a sign of immaturity. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it in in my case, reading it was like a double load of 
you know, things I need to deal with because I was looking at dealing with my codependency for myself, but also my daughter's future, you know, yeah. it's, is at stake. So I was, first part of the book was very hard for me. And then when she touched on how to face your dep- codependency and she, she makes a very clear statement that you have to stop looking at how your behavior right now is impacting your child. Just deal with your codependency because that's the way to really make that impact with your child. And I was like, okay, let me just really focus here. And yeah. that gave me a little bit like I can breathe again, Rome. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was so freaking guilt tripping myself, which is another, you know, basically a symptom of codependency. Well, it's tough to read that. Um in your current state, you're going to pass it over to your child in some way. That's, yeah. That's uh, a, especially that's when she says good. that if you are codependent, basically you have no other choice than yeah. to cause a codependency in your child. Mm-hmm. And only if you start dealing with it, that's the only way out of it. Otherwise just like codependency goes from generation to generation. Yep. So, yep. And right. I, really, I really feel like this book too is is a guide for how to be how to be a healthy parent because even if a person maybe doesn't identify as codependent or doesn't have extreme behaviors that would classify as codependent, she just covers so much ground in here as far as like what healthy boundaries are, how to effectively understand our own wants and needs. Yeah. Um, how to understand and relate to children with encouraging and like nurturing their own wants and needs. And so much of this stuff, I mean, I think about like the different parenting books that have been out over the years. And I'm like, man, Pia, I really would love for her to write a parenting book because this stuff is just, it's so needed. Like these Uh discussions are so needed because even if a person's relatively healthy, odds are they're not thinking about, this kind of stuff, this boundaries and um, healthy dynamics, like how to raise a healthy child in For this. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's so, so key. So well, let I me expect it though. I didn't expect there to be much about parenting in it. Um, Are you parent James? Cause I, I don't remember. Yeah. I have a, I have a daughter. Okay. So you, you get that space of yeah, feeling it, it, double like, it, it like a double edged sword. I was like, oh no. <laughs> now I feel like the most terrible parent of all time. But <laughs> I know that's not it. But when you're reading it, it's, um, it really uh, it, it hits you pretty hard. Yeah. Well, let's jump into the the first part of the notes here and then we can go through it. And you guys feel free to jump in with anything as you think about it. So um, this book, Pia really lays out the, she has five main uh, points that she feels codependent, codependent people have difficulty with five of the following. The first one is experiencing appropriate levels of Mm self-esteem, setting functional boundaries, owning and expressing their own reality, taking care of their adult needs and wants experiencing and expressing their reality moderately. And she goes into detail. And so basically recovering from codependency is going to include like getting those five areas Mm -hmm. um, kind of under control and learning like what healthy self-esteem is and what it isn't and what functional boundaries are and what they aren't. And the whole book, really just like outlines all of this. So she talks about the appropriate levels of self-esteem and she says, basically a healthy sense of self-esteem remains when another per- when a person makes a mistake or is treated poorly by another, when some sort of life, painful life event happens, they declare bankruptcy, they lose their job, um, what hap- whatever might happen. They might feel guilt, fear, anger, or pain, but they don't let it impact their Mm self-worth. So (laughs) really keeping their self-worth and their hurt feelings in two different buckets. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we've talked about before on the channel. And um, so she explains like there's 
the different types of unhealthy self-esteem and there's that less than, and then there's the greater than, and then Mm -hmm. there's the others. And so less than self-esteem is feelings of inferiority. Like you just don't, you feel less than others. Um, The greater than is feelings of grandiosity or superiority. And then others type of self-esteem was where we get self-esteem from other people. So it's that continual need for validation that, that we're okay. Um, or, or, or things, from, or things, right. Like degrees, yeah. advanced degrees, uh, status, clothing, status type car, or your performance or, yeah, or how, how well mm-hmm. our children do or what our children do. Um, these kinds of things. And that's a very fragile way to live. And if a person's getting their other, their, their self-esteem from outside of themselves, especially if they're getting it from their child, then it's a really, that right there just sets up a really dysfunctional relationship because then the child's validation is, she talks about the, the difference between a functional family and a dysfunctional family is a functional family. Uh, the parent is there to meet the child's needs and a dysfunctional family the child is there to meet the parents' needs. And I thought that was really well said. And so that other self-esteem, so you can see if the child is there to meet the parents' own needs for self-esteem, it's it's skewed right from day one. The child has no ability to just be who they really are. Yes. They are they are there just basically to to make the parent happy or or I don't know, fulfill the needs of the parent all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. And uh, the second point is she talked about setting functional boundaries. And I really like how she, she viewed, um, well, actually, let's back up to self-esteem real quick. Have you guys noticed, like, how, what would you say your relationship is with self-esteem? <laughs> James, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear James. Oh, James, we can't hear you. Hold on. Oh, that was a weird thing on my end. Hold on. There, James. Yeah. Okay, we can hear you now. Weird. I don't know. Um, it, it's been kind of exactly how she described in the book, <laughs> up and down, depending on, you know, outside instead of within myself. Um, and that's it's tough to say um, on camera, but it's the truth. So, um it there was many eye-opening moments in the book and this was definitely one of them um and it it sucks but at least now i know one thing i need to work on to to actually solve the codependency because i've read um two other codependency books and they kind of go you know in the detail of what to do but not like how pia melody does any you know i'm talking about she's very direct and to the point and um, in great detail. So it's, yeah. it's interesting you mention different books because I feel like other literature is like pushing you to feel like super, super good. Like they do not um, address that it should be like moderation. Like you shouldn't feel super excited and like be on this high level all the time and be, you know, like gra- grandiosity. And I feel like other other books that i've read before are like different videos i watched it was all about just empower yourself you know like like just like get it going stay stay like powerful all the all these things so i i feel her saying that it's all about moderation and your self-esteem should come from within and just like be this um sense of in in inherent value just because you are um yeah it's that's perfect no yeah. i don't have that yet i do have moments though <laughs> so yeah like- she and i don't i don't know if it was her or if it was another video i was watching but um somewhere somebody had said something like you know each human being is here to basically sing your own song like there is hmm. i like that i love right? it and i do too i thought that was so well said like each person has their own set of strengths and weaknesses and and their own passions and interests. And, um, you know, like you, there's never been anybody here like you before. There's never been, there'll never be anybody like you after you. 
like you th- truly there is this uniqueness and she just des- describes it as preciousness about each person um but but also balance in a way of like but we're all precious like we all have this uniqueness about us um but th- that's where that inherent worth worth comes from is like everybody is there has their own song and if they're nurtured in the right way then they're more able to readily express it but the good news is as adults we can go back and we can start working on um be- becoming more authentic and more ourselves so we really can get in tune with singing that song um yeah and last miranda is asking here you know basically is it how do we get validation from within uh Good question and i i really do think it was what, what healthy love was talking about like it's truly just tapping into realizing it's understanding that you have inherent value and worth like there is, you are so unique. And I mean, my goodness, like the odds of being born are like something like one in 400 billion, you know? So like, just right there, the fact that you made it, <laughs> you made it, <laughs> you yes. made it like you're here, you know, you just kind of won the, the lotto in a sense. I mean, it's the odds of you being here is just so infinitesimal. And yeah. um, so I think it's just, given. It's a, yeah. it's a given. She actually says that being valuable, it's a, a natural characteristic of being a child. Yeah. Just yeah. value in your being. And, um, but I think to answer the question, like, how do you get there? So Pia based all her work basically in her, like, spirituality. So, you know, and for her, it was, I think, Christianity, but you can have your own spirituality. And basically according to her your value comes a lot from accepting like from your relationship with your higher power and from discovering your perfect imperfections so you are we're going to talk more about it later but you basically valuing yourself with all the flaws and mistakes you make and you have a higher power that helps you out and guides you to just you know get to the next level i don't know learn from your mistakes and also just like sharing sh- sharing it with others and, and really hearing other people experience. So I don't think that mm-hmm. those those five core symptoms you can look look at them like separately because if you if you read the whole book you will see that they all are connected with each other. Mm-hmm. Like your value is connected with how you express your boundaries and how you keep your boundaries and I would take care of your own wants and needs and all, all, all of that together. So it's not a one dimension. It's all of those right. dimensions together. Mm-hmm. I don't think I answered the question. If I confuse you more, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, and Missouri, com- Missouri Cowboy makes the comment that um, he has a hard time accepting that everyone is precious. And I, I can totally appreciate that, especially when you're talking about you know, horrific abusers. And I think that everybody starts off as precious. Yeah. Um, And when you have somebody that's extremely abusive and exploitative, I agree. There comes a point where it's like their, their level of toxicity outweighs their preciousness. And that's why we have jail. (laughs) That's why we have the death penalty um, in certain places. So I agree that, but I think everybody has, and it's sad because I think a lot of us know a lot of abusers that are like, man, if you could just take away everything that's all of this, this toxicity with you, like there's still, there's so much right with you underneath that, but like, we can't gloss over all of the abuse and toxicity. Um, yeah. But yeah. So I, 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 yeah, I get that too. Yeah. I struggle. Yep. Yeah. And I, I think that's a codependent thing to, to see the, that there's good in people underneath all the, toxic and all the sludge um but that's that's also very dangerous too i agree i think it's important that we see them for who they are not who they could be yep that because then we're slipping back into the fantasy i just i just had a silly thought i don't know if that will answer it but i feel like in in the animal world like the tiger is as valid as the antelope and as valid as the little bunny like they all precious when they were born but they all have a, like 
But you can say like when you are little bunny, like you hate the tiger and you don't want tiger to be as valuable as you are because what tiger does is goes around and eats bunnies and antelopes. So like there, there is some kind of value in just, in just life itself, but what they do to you, that, that is not, the value of the human is not correlated to what the human does to other human. The value just of life itself. I would just focus on that. I don't know. That's the only yeah. thing that helps I know. I, and I, I guess I struggle with that because I'm not overly enchanted with human life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like my life. <laughs> well, no, I, I would like to be valuable. <laughs> I, 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 don't get me wrong. I mean, I think certain people, they're so dangerous and destructive that they bring more pain than they do value. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm not overly like, you know, I think everybody is so precious in their life has value because I think at some point, like it doesn't. Well, tigers are great. Let's <laughs> give them in the cage so they won't eat us, right? Say so, that again. Tigers are great, but let's keep them in the cage so they won't eat us. Like, and then if tiger goes mad, we're just gonna kill the tiger. That's that's what yeah. I'm thinking. My therapist yeah. did the story about animals one time too to show me how abusers are dangerous, but I don't see it. So he said abusers are like tigers. Would you walk into the cage with a tiger? Why you going on a date with someone who is a tiger like a freaking tiger and i'm like i am not going on a date with tigers again <laughs> so yeah that's a good way to put it yeah um, i guess it's just seeing people for who they are and then responding accordingly you know um okay let's move on to point number two yep <laughs> okay about ba- this is life forever yeah boundaries <laughs> okay so setting functional boundaries and she talks about boundaries are like a skin and they serve three functions uh, first one is to keep certain people from coming into our space and abusing us. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one is to keep ourselves from abusing others. And the third is to give each of us a way of being ourselves. So, and then she talks about boundaries are both internal and external. So our external boundaries would be physical and sexual. So physical is anything relating to non-sexual. So who gets in our personal space, um, how we get into other people's personal space. uh, And then if that, if that physical boundary is intact, then both people there's, there's permission and consent given like, yes, you can borrow my coffee cup or yes, I, I would love a hug. Right. Um, These kinds of things or asking another person, you know, Hey, you know, do you, is it okay if I give you a hug or, um, Hey, can I borrow your jacket? Like the, instead of just taking it, like these kinds of things. Um, I, Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I just, because it keeps showing up, like you say boundaries now, external and internal. And she really made such a great point when she described it like a bell or like a bulletproof vest. And I think that just really stuck to, to like my understanding of boundaries. Like, and I'm thinking like, I'm walking with this little bell around me and that's how I respect my space and the other people's space and how close they can be, how, if they can touch me or not. And then the emotions, the internal boundaries, like this bulletproof jacket that protects my heart and, and or my brain too. <laughs> so that was so great. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. I like to think of it... Um, <clears throat> What was there was one book that we read, I think it was the respect me rules. And they talked about boundaries and like learning to control them. And they talked about it in terms of like zipping or unzipping a jacket. And when we have when when we're missing that internal boundary, we let other we had the zipper on the outside and we let other people just unzip. And so meaning like they'll ask us questions and we just answer that we feel compelled to, to share with them whatever they want us to share with them versus healthy boundaries is turning that zipper inward and we control how much we express and, or answer or say or don't say with others. And I, I liked that analogy too. The, the other thing that I, I got really clear about is she actually says it takes effort to model to enforce your boundaries and to mother great boundaries with others. Like it actually takes effort because I almost feel like we survivor, we almost like 
I don't want to say all of us, but some of us like expect that should be easier, that it should be natural because that's a healthy thing. So it should be easier. We should know how to do it. And it just should be given that uh, at some point we will get it. She doesn't say at some point you will get it and it will be natural. It's actually it's always an effort. Yeah, she talks about that late at, at uh, in the healing chapter at the end of the book about how when we're learning these new skills, it's going to feel very uncomfortable. And she said, it's very common for people to really struggle with like what moderation is. And she gives an example of to the woman or to the person that's used to being very like rigid in their approach to let's say doing dishes for them to leave dirty dishes in the sink overnight might feel like they are being chaotic. And I thought that was a really good thing because when people start setting boundaries, it's very common that they start feeling selfish and rude. Or if they start, um, she gave a, a whole bunch of different lists of, of when we start correcting these imbalances, when we start being moderate, we can either feel like we're being really controlling or we can feel chaotic. If we start having um, reasonable self-esteem, we can start feeling very self-absorbed or very um, like we don't have self-esteem. Mm-hmm. And or very law, lo- kind of like what last Miranda was saying, like, well, if you don't get self-esteem from, from others, like where then where does it come from? So there's this period where we're trying to just get our sea legs about where are we in all of this and kind of figuring it out. There's one something I want to point out about that as well is when we start going through this process and we start working through the, these five core areas and we see how difficult it can be with little, little just little things, um, mm-hmm. with how we moderate our behavior and with how setting boundaries and self-esteem and this kind of stuff. It's important to realize that abusers, if they were to ever change, would go through a very similar process. And it's, I think it's helpful to realize how difficult it is for us that want to change. <laughs> So a lot of people, because people think the same thing about abusers, they're like, oh, that it would be easy, right? Like, it's like flipping a switch. Well, it's not hard. Like, you just stop you just yelling. You stop doing it, yeah. Right. Like, you just stop, you stop yelling, you stop treating me terrible, whatever. But it's it's interwoven throughout their whole personality. And, and to, to make changes like that, it's consistent action and introspection on, like, a very regular, like, you know, probably 10 dozens of times a day basis. Yeah. Um, so I think when you people can see like how difficult change really is, then you see like, oh my gosh, and here I am like wanting to change and it's an uphill climb. And so for somebody that doesn't want to do this, like, oh, forget it. <laughs> like they're a million miles away from changing. They're, a porcupine's not going to turn into a kitten. Yeah, especially <laughs> if you are trained, you know, to, to be that way. By your unconscious, unaware uh, parents. Yeah, and you then, have to, sorry, yeah. you have to reprogram yourself completely, and it's it's really tough um, to get started and to, to keep it up. Um, mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been guilty of you know I'll do it a couple of days, and then some stressor happens, work or you know home life or whatever. And you kind of get off track and it's hard to find your way back on track once you get off of it. It's it interesting is. you say that because I have a similar experience. I feel like some situation and I, uh, P also addresses that, that we go from, especially if we had two caregivers with two different uh, types of boundaries, like non-existence or gaps or walls. And we learn two different ways of, having our boundaries so we can go from one extreme to the other extreme. So extreme. So I, I know some situation I'm like, no boundaries, like, especially in my past, like zero boundary whatsoever. I wasn't even aware of what boundaries are. Yeah. And then there were other situations like, uh, let's say the physical touch. I had walls. Like if you freaking t- touched me, I would like go after you and try to, I don't know, like kick you or something. (laughs) Like I would, you know, like, and I was like teenager then, right? So I was uncontrollable, but I was really going from one extreme to the other extreme throughout my life until I started some healing and, you know, finding out like, oh, wow, being an adult is actually trying to find the, the like middle ground of all of it. 
and um yep <laughs> that's yeah. what i am right now like looking for my mother grant most of the time and it's not such an easy thing to to do it's it not, but it's so interesting so here bear nolan makes a comment says buddha would love boundaries oh i um, love that comment yes. i do too yeah how can you love another without first knowing where you end and they begin? And that is so well said because yeah. it's so true. Like if we're so enmeshed with another person, we're not seeing them for who they really are. It's mm-hmm. either the fantasy or it's the expectation um, mm-hmm. yeah. or it's that need for validation. And yeah. when we can realize like what we have control over, which is ourselves yeah. Um, yeah. and we're not, like, ah, oh, I just, I, I, there's so much I really enjoyed out, out of this book. Like when we have self, healthy self-esteem and we're not relying on them to, to build our self-esteem and we're not coming from a place of like less than or greater than, then we can actually be in ourselves and we can appreciate, ha- there's this room to breathe and then they can breathe. Cause it's like, you can totally be you because I, I don't need you to be anything other than you are assuming that they're a healthy person, right? Or mm-hmm. like a reason that, like on the path. Right. Um, and we have that he- that healthy, in- that functional, I like how she says that too. It's functional or dysfunctional. The functional internal boundary of if they say anything that like I get to decide where that lands within me. Like it might hurt my feelings, but it doesn't need to negatively impact my self-worth. Mm-hmm. And, or it might be, something that's um, offensive to me, but I can determine like, oh, that's a reflection of them. That's not a reflection of me. Right. Like yeah. I don't have to own that. That's, th- there's so much uh, power there when you realize like, yes, my, this is my space and this is your space. And I, I get, I really can choose like what comes into my space. And she, she talks about that with, uh, well, let me go back to the sexual boundary. Then we'll move over to the internal boundary. But the sexual boundary controls space and touch and says who, what, when, where, why, and how, and also has respect for the other person. So it's obviously, it's a give and take. Our internal boundary, which is what we were just talking about, protects our thinking, feeling, and behavior and keeps them functional. When we take responsibility for our thinking, feeling, and behavior and keep that separate from that of others, we stop blaming them for what we think, feel, and do, and we effectively stop for those that might be like manipulating and controlling those around them. Um, And we also stop getting caught up in manipulative and controlling behavior. Uh, A person without boundaries often has their own boundaries violated as well as violates the boundaries of others as everything is blurred. I think that is so right on. Mm -hmm. Well, just like you just said, you don't know where you stop and they begin. Right. And if we're looking to them and I, you know, I had shared something the other day about when I was working at a domestic violence shelter and I felt, oh, Bear, real quick. Thank you for the live stream donation. Um, he says, love you guys. Oh, I know. Ow. <laughs> Appreciate it. That's awesome. But uh, when I was working at a domestic violence shelter, that was, I was in completely new territory and This was before I was, I had any, before I'd met, well, I was dating Jack at the time, but I um, didn't know everything that was going on. And so I was not familiar with trauma to the extent of what a lot of these women had gone through. And so all of my skill set, which was basically like overly reassuring people in a physical way, um, like, you know, hugging a hand on a shoulder um, just trying to, you know, prolonged eye contact, like these kinds of things to make people feel safe. It had the exact opposite effect there. And I felt so helpless, but instead of realizing that I was crossing a boundary with them, I doubled up my efforts thinking like, oh, I'm just not getting clear to them that I am a safe person and that I care. So I just need to work twice as hard. But the reality is that was pushing them away twice as much, right? Yep because it it was a violation of their boundary. It just didn't compute for me. So understand just the understanding of how we want to interact with people and how they want to be interacted with are two very different things. Yes. And to just be aware of that. Um, So, yeah, it's just such a, such an eye opener when we see that. And she talks about too, uh, 
the four different kinds of boundary issues that, and I, here's another thing she re- refers to codependency as something that happens at, as the disease of immaturity from less than nurturing parenting. And I, I like that she makes this designation. I don't like that. <laughs> well, but I think it's important because people get hung up on like, oh, only abuse or neglect is an issue. But it's like there's on the more like quote unquote mild end of abuse and neglect can have similar disastrous consequences. And the goal isn't to avoid abuse and neglect. The goal is to move towards nurturing parenting. And so I I like that she spelled that out, but I think a lot of people might have an issue with that because it's like, well, geez, like that's 90% of the world. And I think, I think Pia would say, yes, you're right. Yeah. And that's the problem. The the good news, I'm sorry. The good news is here that, you know, it's true. We are probably like 90% of the world is codependent because we did not have a great nurturing you know, parents, our parents were raised by people who survived Second World War and for them just to give us food and send us to school was good enough and give us roof over our head and there was no bomb exploding, right? And, you know, there are still some countries when there's reality, actually, there is a war, so they don't get nurture either. So, like, if we look at the state of the world, we are actually lucky that we got to... Mm -hmm. explore it and deal with it now because our children now can raise their children children in a in a different way they can actually like it it hit me i was like why i've never talked with my daughter about hey parenting is a skill you know maybe i can talk to you a little bit about parenting at some point in your life like it's a skill we should talk about it It, it's Mm-hmm. It's not just, we don't have any classes for parents that if you go to a class about parenting, they will teach you how to change diapers, I think, right. Right. and breastfeeding. And then they probably will give you a little bit about how not to physically abuse a child, <laughs> stuff like that. That's what I remember. It's well, a- and I think, I think you bring up a good point, right? So like we are um, on kind of this cusp of this emotional, really emotional evolution so we've had all these different, like, I think, re- revolution, whatever you want to term it. But, you know, if yes, if you're in a country that's war torn and or even here in this country, 200, 300 years ago, you're not focused with like following your dreams or becoming self-aware. You're focused on survival. Uh, emotional health like who the heck was thinking about whether you're depressed or not like dude you're alive right like we don't have we don't have time for this the cows need milking and the hay isn't going to bail itself so like you know get out there and and get going and there was no childhood no and you know, I don't think was- you were old enough you did something you fed chickens you mm-hmm pick tomatoes, you took care of your younger brothers and sisters. 5 and- a.m. I had to milk the freaking cow in my grandma's during summer. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that's normal. That was thing to do. Try it later. And I think to some extent, like helping out is important, right? But if you're working a child, you know, 12 hours a day and they're cons- they're being treated like an adult and, and if they're in a war-torn country or a developing country, they're exposed to really adult things at a very young age, death and disease and fear and loss. And none of that is, um, I'm sure, like able to be handled adequately because who really like, my goodness, even if you had mental health, like that's so much to try to process when that stuff happens at such a young age. And yeah, and kids don't really have a boundary at all. So it's right. It makes it even harder. It does. Well, yeah, I need to step up for like 30 seconds, just take care of the dog quickly because she, okay. she's making noises and I don't want to do it. So I will mute myself. Okay. So let me go on to the four different types of boundaries because I think these are really good. So she talks about, James, what you're talking about, the no boundaries and children have no boundaries. And also people that have gone through abuse or neglect tend to also have no boundaries. Um but health, so the opposite of that, people with healthy, intact boundaries, um, well, people with healthy, intact boundaries, they, they know where they begin and where others end. And they're able to do all of, all of these five 
core areas that she say she says that we have trouble with, they're able to do this. Um, right. The second one is damaged boundaries. So a person with damaged boundaries has holes in them. They may be able to set boundaries in some others and not others. Uh, so, so accurate. Perhaps with friends, partners, parents, children, yeah. or when they are scared, tired, or sick. Um, they may also try and control or manipulate others in certain situations, but not in others. It can also make a person take responsibility for someone else's feelings, thinking, or behavior. So the damaged bound, I thought this was really profound. The damaged boundary is if we're not aware of where we end and where another person begins, then if another person's not responsible, if they're, if they have damaged boundaries and they're not handling their feelings appropriately. So for, she uses the example of a person's not feeling shame or guilt for their behavior, then those feelings are going to go somewhere. And generally it's going to go to the child or to the spouse so then the spouse might feel shame or guilt for the way that their spouse is acting. Like, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. I cannot believe he or she did that. Like this person has no shame. Whereas the child, um, because they have no boundary, they also have no context or understanding. The child might internalize that and be like, this is my fault. I did something wrong or bad. Instead of seeing it as like, no mom or dad is the one that's has is out of control like this their behavior is a reflection of them it's not a reflection of me i'm five years old right like i'm five years old i'm acting like i'm five years old uh but a child doesn't see it that way so i thought that was good and then she also talks about walls instead of boundaries so walls are usually made up of anger or fear and people with walls like this give off the message either verbally or non-verbally that they will become reactive if confronted or if things don't go their way. People who use wall, a wall of fear retreat from others in life. They give off the energy that if you come close, they will fall apart. Um, and there's also walls of silence where they observe and don't participate. Also, a wall of words is the opposite. They keep trying to, they keep talking when others try and contribute. So all of these... Are you I'm going to interrupt you because that's oh. exactly what I would do all the time in that wall. And I keep seeing still I'm doing it and I did it just again, but that's exactly how it's there for me. Like I rather talk than let other talk because I feel that I'm safer that way in many situations. Like not with you, it's not that case, but like I see myself in so many situations when I still have that band, like the wall of me talking a lot. Like social settings, when you, when you, like, I think there's two different types of people. Like if you are stressed in social settings, like some events, like networking, some people will be walking around and talking to everyone all the time. I will be that person. And some other people will be like quiet standing by the wall. Yeah. That's a wall of silence. I was like, this is brilliant. Like I never thought that's a boundary issue. I've never thought that in my whole life. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think that's definitely worth exploring. Like I have, Found there's been times in my life where I definitely have just like dominated a conversation or, um, uh, and I, I can feel when I'm doing it and I'm embarrassed by my own behavior because I'm like, Dana, my goodness, like what is going on? And like, shut up, let them talk to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. And, um, it's interesting. So when this stuff comes to light, like even the self esteem stuff, stuff too, like now that I'm more aware of it, I can see in conversations that when my self-esteem starts shifting, it's generally from like lower than to greater than. And I, now that I'm aware of it, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, um, and maybe like a, an example of greater than might be saying something that's ugly and like unnecessary about another person. Um, like, oh, that person, their hair is like, what were they thinking? Or, but you know, basically putting other people down when like that's not necessary. Huh? Like a judgmental place. Yeah. It, thank you. That's a better way of saying it. Like just becoming judgmental or frustrated or feeling like, you know, just this attitude of superiority. And I, I have a, I have a like concrete example. So mm -hmm. I love clean, organized house. And if I meet someone and I walk into their house and it's not tidy, 
I would def I would right away make a judgment. I am better than you. Definitely. Mm. I, I, will, I will feel that. Definitely. But then if I walk somewhere and I see the house is like spotless, wonderful, it's like, and it's more organized than mine, I will make a judgment. I am so worse than this person. Like they, I have to look up to them and just, you know, chase after them. Yeah. So that's a great example. They're like that. the higher power, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, like she talks about that in the the yeah. intimacy factor book that we're very quick to make um, certain other people that we feel have it more together, like mm-hmm. into our higher power, we place them on a pedestal like that. Mm-hmm. It's interesting when you can start seeing this stuff in yourself surface, and then you realize this is a problem, like kind of that moderation and realizing that um, really kind of well adjusted people don't need don't shift continually between like this less than greater than less than greater than or others than um type self-esteem it's more of a moderate study yeah study kind of thing so what i what i found in me when those feelings tend to surface um like the the judgment things about other people it's it's generally the judgment happens when it's something i i feel insecure about within my own self and so i've tried to kind of when that stuff does surface, I'm like, Oh, Dana, that's something that you need to address because it's, there's something within you that's feeling insecure. And so um, take a step back and examine it. Cause it's not even about them. (laughs) Like it's really not about them. It's about me and my own insecurities. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, uh, and then she talks about, okay, so part four of this, the boundaries is moving from a wall to a non-existent boundary and back again. And so this is what you were saying, healthy love. I think it was mm-hmm. you about yeah. if you've got parent, if you've two different parents, so if maybe one parent has walls and one parent has no boundaries, then it's really common for the child or the adult child of a family structure like that to start really going back and forth between having walls and then having no boundaries. And they're confused and they're trying to navigate the world, but they just don't know how and in any effective way. Yeah. I think it's, I, I don't, I don't remember if she said that, but when I was looking at my example, mm-hmm. I feel that it's, it's, it's especially extreme if you are raised by a parent when one was an abuser and the other was a victim and you witnessed that abuse. Yeah. Like, I think that, that is really like, because you see that two of very extreme word in front of you as a child. Yeah. I would also, my, my experience with this and um, what I've seen in others is this is also very common after trauma. So like when people get out of abuse, they're, if their old boundary system, which they might not have realized before, they might not have really had boundaries. So they trusted everyone. They took mm-hmm. everyone at face value. They were they were an open book, right? Like they just the zipper was on the outside. Other people set the pace, mm-hmm. and that might have worked for them up until this abusive relationship. And so now they're like, "Oh my goodness, I'm so terrified of being hurt." And these walls go up, and then they're it's this. Then it becomes very extreme. I don't, now I don't trust anyone. Um, now I don't tell anybody anything. And it's this extreme behavior because they're trying to kind of figure out how do I navigate the world again? Because I, you know, when you're hurt like this, especially by somebody um, that you love or that was charming and you just didn't even see it coming, it can really throw a person for a loop because it's like, man, every, my map of the world was really incomplete. And now I'm not sure how I go about this again. And I've experienced it and I've seen it with other people where they're like, they're maybe from friends and family or even therapists around them treat it like, Oh, this abusive relationship was an isolated incident. You really have to just go out there and love like you've never been hurt before. And then odds are they just crash right back into another abuser because if, if they don't know how to, if they can't discern a health, a safe, an emotionally or physically safe person from an emotionally or physically unsafe person, this pattern is going to continue. And it's, and of course, it's difficult when you have an emotionally unsafe person who comes across like Prince or Princess Charming. Mm-hmm. I think it should be forbidden to say to anyone, oh, that was just isolated. 
abuse situation and you can just go and trust someone else it's because that's basically it's the worst advice ever yeah and you don't deal with yeah. anything i mean even if yeah. that was isolated situation you still got hurt so you have to first deal with that hurt and learn from it like even even yeah. uh, pia says here that nothing that you don't deal with like things that you don't deal with they they are unresolved and those are the very problematic yeah. Uh, it they cause very problematic symptoms in your life later, and if you don't, the longer you don't deal with it, that the more problematic it becomes, and then you're ending up with more problematic situations, basically. And there's no growth, no healing, nothing possible. Yeah. Well, um, and when they say it, it's almost like they're denying your reality of yes, you God, yes. And you're like, unless you were there, you're not going to understand it. So it it completely changes. For me, it changed the entire way I looked at everybody everything in the world like, it's like when you get if you were raped they cannot just tell you oh that was isolated rape like it just happened one time it will never happen to you again it's like no you have to deal with the trauma that you were mm -hmm. you were impacted by yeah <laughs> yeah there's and there's a lot there i think even if a person had um and i think i like how she talked about the boundaries when a person has damaged boundaries, they have holes in their boundaries. I think those people especially can be really lost in the fog of all of this because they're like, I mean, and I've had people email me before. They're like, Dana, I am a high powered executive or I'm an attorney or I'm a police officer. Like I don't take crap from people. Like, how did I get here? How did I get here? And they're so and I get, I mean, my, my heart, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Like my heart goes out to them because I, I can only imagine how, like how confusing that would be. It's like, I don't fit the mold of like this kind of classic codependent person or even an abused person, but yet here I am. And it's, they, I think that's the perfect example of a person with holes in their boundaries because most people, I mean, again, the vast, this stuff is not taught and it really should be starting in elementary school with understanding healthy boundaries and all of this stuff. Agreed. Um, nobody sees this stuff coming and we all think that we would, but we're all wrong, you know? And it's easy to, to look at another person that's in an abusive relationship and just think, ah, she needs to leave him or he yeah. needs to leave her or whatever. But it's a lot harder when you have that emotional investment in that person. Yeah, and or when you when you when you do recognize it but you start making excuses and you start giving chances and oh well they they can change i just need to give them the opportunity to to try to change and right it's not that easy at all and you have all of these dysfunctional messages from people yeah. around you that are like well nobody's perfect and it could be worse and you know all of this stuff so it's just mm -hmm. a person just at the end of it they're like i don't know what's up is down and what's down is up and how long do I hang on before I walk away? And am I a failure? Did I not try hard enough if I walk away? And what if they can change? And what if it's me? And there's all of this confusion at play. And yeah, um, but I'm yes, I'm of that for sure. Cause I, yeah. I asked a lot of people like, Hey, is this normal? Is, you know, what should I do? What do you think? And, you know, everybody has their own slightly different opinion and, and view on it. So it just, it confuses you. Cause then, like you said, you, you don't know what's up or down. You don't know. You're not sure what direction to take at all or what to do because you're getting too many opinions. Right. Opinions of people yeah. that don't understand abuse at all. Right. And I would even say, like, I feel like knowing what we all know now about boundaries, that's one of the biggest red flags to me now is when somebody says, um, basically what, what do you think about this? Or what do you think I should do? Or is this person really a narcissist or a sociopath? Because right there, that tells me that this person is disconnected from their reality. And that the, if they're looking to, towards, and I get it because I've been there, um, that they're looking to others for that validation, then that's a really big problem. Even if this relationship were to end, that alone, like that mindset of that, having that, placing that control, giving so much control to other people mm -hmm. is a huge problem. And it's that, I mean, it's a crapshoot if that's 
going to blow up in their face again in the future. Odds are it probably will. Yeah. Well, in, that's that's touching on the next part, but I don't think we there yet. The only and expressing your own reality. Like if you cannot think for yourself and feel for yourself and make judgments for yourself and decisions for yourself, and you you're not either not aware of what's happening, or you are aware but you are afraid to act on it. Um, that's mm -hmm. it's all. That's why I feel it's all connected. Your boundaries with. Like all the symptoms together are really connected. They really are. I mean, like yeah. we yeah. can't make goods. We can't be self-protective or even be loving towards ourselves or others if we're so disconnected from ourselves. Yeah. If you don't value yourself, you will not set boundaries to protect yourself. And then right. you don't value how you look at the world. Like it's like you don't even value one thought you have about the world then. And if you're, not, if you're not connected enough with your, I mean, it's so all interconnected. Like if you're not connected enough with your body to understand um, or to, for it to register when you're being mistreated, mm -hmm. then you're not going to set boundaries. You don't. Like I, yeah. I had non-existent yeah. sexual boundaries for the longest because my abuse was so early in my life. And I literally would like, if someone was threatening me, I would like stop feeling my body. Like it was gone. Like, it mm -hmm. wasn't like, so it was non-existent, completely boundary, zero. And it's, that's how real it is. Yeah, it is. And, and so many people will say like, they wait for that concrete proof. They wait. And I should say it's extreme concrete proof that there's a problem before they start setting a boundary. And that's it's a problem. It's yeah. too late then. Like it, you know, yeah. and so and I think that's one of the biggest things here. Like if we can shift realizing when you're feeling perpetual confusion, when you're feeling mental anguish, when you're feeling irritation and anxiety and, and upset and um, anger, these are all signs of boundary violations. And yeah. these are important signs and they're just as concrete as any, they're as real as anything else. And we don't need to wait for them to prove us right. Like we don't right. need to catch them in bed with somebody else or for them to hit us or, you know, start screaming at us or any of these things. Like, that. You have to trust your your own feelings and your own intuition. Yeah, yeah but you do it only if you have well developed functional yeah. boundaries, <laughs> and you're in tune with your, your body. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> it's it's a it's a challenge. You have to really, you know, take on your codependency from every you know perspective, yeah. in every situation, and just you know, just really face it. So, yeah. So let's cover the, the third point here, which is what you're talking about, the reality. She says, codependents don't often know what their reality is. Um, reality has four components, the body, our thinking, feeling, and behavior. And in terms of our body, it's how we look and how our bodies are operating. So a person that has trouble with this might either know how, okay, so she, I love this. So she divides it up into, we either un we either have some sort of understanding of some of ourselves or we don't. So yeah. we either know how we look and we don't want to admit it, mm -hmm. or we might not, we might be so disconnected. We don't know how we look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. She might, said at one point, didn't she say like, when you look in the mirror, you don't see yourself, you see like your dad or your mom or, and it's, or, that's, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. To hear, but uh, I guess I could see where it's um it's possible. That's not me, not me though. But she she gave um an example of uh kind of having a a need met. Well, maybe here's another example of this with pain. Mm -hmm. A lot of us we might <laughs> here is a personal example. I for the longest time did not realize when I was in physical pain. And <laughs> Uh, I was so used to just being in physical pain and glossing over it. Like sucking it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then until my back would go out mm -hmm. and then I couldn't move and I'd have to go get a, like a deep tissue massage and go to the chiropractor mm -hmm. and take pain pills. And I was in bed for like three days. Mm -hmm. um, it was awful. And I remember thinking like, cause people would ask me like, really? Like it just all of a sudden would go out and then, it took me a long time to realize, oh, actually, no, there's all of these early signs that like my back would start spasming and I'd catch myself like rubbing my shoulders and like trying to work out tension and stretching. And there were all of these signs, but I just 
glossed over them until things got so bad I couldn't move. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, I wasn't even really, I wasn't even aware of the pain until I, I could no longer deny it. And um, so there's a lot of that with, with our body, like we're not understanding. Um, and she talks about too, like with eating disorders, a person might gain a bunch of weight or lose a bunch of weight and not realize how they look like they're, they're either uh, they know how they look and they don't want to admit it, or they truly don't know how they look, which I think is often the case. Then you see a photo of yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, like when did I gain this weight? Right. Or when yeah. did I lose this weight? Like you're just shocked by what you see. Cause we're so out of tune um, with our body. And so then the thinking part of that. So uh, if we have difficulty knowing what our thoughts are, then we're going to have difficulty being able to accurately share them. And if difficulty with thinking also gives skewed interpretations to incoming data. So. Um, Feeling of confusion. I actually remember that symptom very well when people would ask me, how are you feeling? How are you? What are you thinking? And I would be like, I didn't like that. Like now, like I would like it's not be able to say it. anything because there was nothing for me to articulate over there. Like I knew yeah. I was thinking something, but I just couldn't express it at all because it was all like confusion to me. So, and the same yeah. emotion, like it's, it's because that, that lack of connection to your awareness of your reality can, can impact everything, your body, your behavior, right? Like your emotion. And then um, you're thinking, and there was something else, but like I, I'm continually blown away. Um, you know, I was I had shared last night. I had this realization that I think I str- I'm not. I think I I really realizing like I struggle with um, kind of like these perfectionistic tendencies, and then it's like well, it's weird. How did I not know that about myself? And like, and then just other thoughts or. Or I'll do things like I'll say, I get all excited about wanting to do these, all these different projects. And I'll be like, yeah, 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 totally. I'm totally in. And then I way over commit myself and then I can't follow through on them. So like, there's this disconnect. I sincerely mean everything that I say when I sign up for projects, like it, but it's not thought through. Um, So there's this disconnect between like me and understanding like how much I can actually do. And how well or not well I can do it, it's weird. So, yeah. What's, what's crazy is that lack of complete awareness. Like, and I think it's, because, it's, you know, like abusers are like also codependents, but they're like this extreme, arrogant, and har- harmful, um, you know, side of it. Mm-hmm. And I remember my husband would do certain things and then he would just like completely not know he did it. Like it, he wasn't in, and I think it actually fitted with him. Like, I don't think he was lying. He was like, he really believed every freaking word he was saying. That's how unaware he was of what he did. So that, that's like, that can happen from, from both sides. Now that doesn't right. excuse the behavior, of course, no. but, but it's that it- lack of awareness. Like, it's like you completely not aware you did something or you said something or you thought something. None of that is aware to you. Like, yeah. Well, I think they're so disconnected from their reality that that gives them the ability to create reality on the fly. And maybe that's why they, they don't commit suicide because if they remember every single thing they did and being very really aware of how much harm they're causing, I don't know. Like I was, I was, cause one time I remember I was, I was just wondering, like, I'm not even trying to have any compassion there, but I was just wondering like, how can you look in the mirror? Like literally, how can you look in the mirror? Like I wouldn't be able to look in the mirror knowing what I've had done to another human being, but well, you can. when you feel entitled to do what you do, there is no guilt or shame. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but, when, yeah. but when abusers do commit suicide, it's not. It's generally not because of what they've done. It's they don't want to face the consequences of what. Giving attention done. and chase you even after they dead, they want to hurt you too. Yeah. Like they it has know. nothing to do with remorse. It no, has nothing. everything to do with like I don't want to go to jail for life or, um, or they're they're lonely or they're depressed about some sort of other issue, but mm-hmm. it's not because of how they treat no. others. No, um, completely. No, yeah. I, I get that. Yeah. So, okay. So feeling what we're talking about is 
uh, difficulty knowing what we are feeling or, or the opposite, feeling overwhelming emotions, which is, goes hand in hand with borderline personality disorder, which makes total sense because I really feel that there's so much overlap between borderline personality disorder and codependence. And I think borderline truly is something that stems, it really might even just be one and the same. Well, it is not. It's just a, a comp- it's like, I, I, re- I just remember what it was, but I read something and I was like that the studies by psychologists that borderline and narcissists, it's all codependence. It's just, it, it all streams out of the codependence. It's the same mechanism, except that those are going into the malignant side of being codependent. So that's why we survivors and victims don't like being called codependent often because it's like the same freaking umbrella, but it's, yeah. It's a similar mechanism, so it's it's all like in this one. It's almost like all prunes, all prunes are plants, but not all plums are prunes, right? Like you, you just have to get at mm-hmm. accept that we 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 all stream from like the codependence. Yeah. It just they are there are two different extremes. There's a one extreme uh, when you become like more like empath, and the other extreme when you become an abuser. And you can either be a perfect victim on one very extreme. Um, and or you can be perfect abuser on the other extreme and I think it's yeah. maybe very triggering to well it's a boundary yeah. issue yeah right like that's that's the common denominator for both of those is you have um, abusers who have no boundaries right there's no especially self-containment boundary so mm-hmm. that's and that's fueled by this this entitlement mentality and probably a lot of unaddressed issues as well um whereas the uh, opposite side of the stream of that is extreme codependency who also has no boundaries but they're not trying to actively abuse others but they're not aware that they're actively being abused and that's a problem pia melody i I think it was in a video that i saw of hers once she touched on it briefly in this book that basically untreated codependency can lead to death suicide addiction um all, and i agree completely like i think it's a such a huge thing that because a person's going to keep running these patterns of these these five core symptoms like if these five areas are out of alignment um a person you're going to keep getting hurt time and time again and not realize what's going on and after a certain amount of time i could see how a person was just like i'm i'm cursed like i'm just done you know and they just give up and they're just done Um, so, or they're murdered because they keep seeing the good in other people and they're living in the fantasy and they stay in dangerous situations because there's no self-protective boundary there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a big deal. Um, it was weird to see uh, like the similarities between like what you hear about narcissists being manipulative and stuff and codependence being manipulative too, because it, (laughs) I wasn't expecting that to, to be in this book, um, you know, like that word manipulative and stuff. That's, that sucks to read and to know that it makes well, me feel like really but because there's a difference. You're not malignant, but you still like wow. everyone can manipulate someone and, and mm-hmm. ask that, you know, the non-malignant codependent people like us, like the one, the ones that we are more like a victim mice, I guess for us, manipulation is like, we are unaware of it sometimes because it's just the way for us to deal with and trying to survive, I guess, that's yeah. and protect ourselves. I don't know. Well, I, think, I think it's a deep discussion. It's, 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 I, it's just stay away from it. <laughs> I, well, no, I think it's important to address. I, I see it as, as when um, it's, ex- so you've got, I think, codependents that are more of the people pleasing variety. They're not necessarily manipulative. And of course, this is on a spectrum, but then you have the caretaking ones. Mm-hmm. And the caretaking ones tend to be very controlling. Oh, you need to wear a jacket. Oh, you need to wear a scarf. Oh, you need to do this. Oh, you should do this. Oh, 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 oh. And it's smothering and it's, mm-hmm. and it's, it, it might be coming from a place of like care and concern, but it's micromanaging. And, um, can you be a blend of both though? Sure. I, I think of so. It's, 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 these are all boundaries, spectrum. boundary issues. And so, um, I, I think most people, when you when you read this book, myself included, you're like, "Wow, okay, yeah, I, yeah. like a little from all of the categories." 
mm-hmm. and a little in certain categories at different times in my life. Um, but I think the, the one thing, I mean, with Pia Melody, the, I think the beauty of her work is there's no room for confusion. Like you read through this and you're like, okay, she spells this out so clearly yep. that and once you have that level of awareness of, oh my goodness, I did not realize that this was a problem or I didn't realize that I was doing this. Mm-hmm. I think for most of us, because we do seem, we do seek to be team oriented uh, and solutions oriented. We see this and we're like, oh my goodness. Okay. Yes. I, this is something that I'd like to work on. And uh, even just having that awareness can often change, like radically change a person's behavior just bringing it to their awareness. So definitely. Well, it's, it's hard to feel that we are on the same spectrum, but you know, (laughs) yeah, it's, it's hard. It's a pill hard to swallow, but it makes sense though, because that's why I kind of struggled for a while. And I would ask in some of Dana's live streams, like, you know, what's the difference in needing validation for a codependent and for a narcissist and, you know, what's the, what's the difference between a few other things? Um, can't think of them right now, but. Well, you're not going to go and hurt someone just to get validation, right? And narcissists will just go and do that. Right. <laughs> so let's, yeah, they, they malignant basically. And right. they. I think codependents have more of a sense of self, whereas narcissists just really don't. And yeah. narcissists have more of, their defense mechanism that's engaged is that fight defense, whereas codependence, it's more of the friend or the freeze or the flight defenses. Mm-hmm. And so, codependence is like, more like a condition, not disorder. Name? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, I was just saying that, you know, uh, diagnostically speaking, like codependence isn't like personality disorder. It's just like a spectrum or like a, a what, condition. It's a condition. When narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, those are extreme. They 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 extreme and they have like some extras to it. I'm gonna say that way, and they are a personality disorder. Like they are so deep on that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I mean, go ahead. Is codependency in the DSM? No, no, it's um, not. Because my therapist mentioned um, it's not codependent. Is it? Um, is it dependent? Dependent personality? personality, something, and I think that's in the DSM. So yes, that's kind of the the difference. It's um, it's different in the sense that that dependent personality disorder is um, a person that has that is truly. I would say that's a subsection of how Pia Melody is defining codependence. So, like dependent personality is it's quite something when you see it in an adult it's an adult that truly acts like a child and they are completely unable they look they turn for a a a woman they might turn their spouse into their father and they become very childlike and they just they are completely unable to take care of themselves they rely on others they're still relying on their parents they're still um it's it's extreme it's extreme dependence yeah it's that does sound pretty extreme. It's a, I mean, it's, it's a big deal. I mean, it's enough of a big deal to, for it to be considered a, you know, a personality disorder. Codependence, I think the difference is codependence is more, and I like the way that Pia Melody describes it because it's more encompassing. It's like a person can be dependent, they can be anti dependent. Uh-huh. Um, they can be, uh, you know, they, there's these trouble, these struggles with boundaries. A lot of, this, all of this stuff is really, you know, the, kind of these core issues of like self-care, self-esteem, self-worth, uh, self-protection, yeah, um, and just getting into alignment uh, with ourselves. Well, I wouldn't feel like I'm a codependent, no shame in it. I'm dealing with my codependency. It's, it's a condition you can completely recover from if you put some work into it. I actually bought a workbook for myself, so I'm taking it on. And but those those um what well, we just said those they they can't really they they I mean, cannot they, but we can they could in theory and there's a certain guy on YouTube that claims he can cure it but he can't claim he he can't cure himself so it's kind of yeah. like 
it's probably not possible. Well, I think whenever, like we were talking about earlier, as far as change goes, like a person has to experience enough pain as the catalyst for all change. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there has to be enough pain of like what we're doing isn't working for us to, to get out of that comfort zone and to do something right. different. If a person's like, not experiencing guilt or shame or remorse, yeah. there's no pain present. So if yeah, they yeah. feel entitled, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the whole, if you think about like the civil war, I mean, people had slaves, right. And they felt entitled to have slaves. They saw nothing wrong with it. And mm -hmm. it took a war to happen to be like, this needs to stop. Like mm -hmm. you guys don't see what you're doing is wrong. Right we're going to fight you over it. And so, so sometimes massive action has to happen, but like mm -hmm. people, people, if they don't see that within themselves of like, what I'm doing is wrong, there's no catalyst to change. And, right. and in going through all of this, like change is such, it's a daily process of like continual reexamination and experiencing continual pain. Like mm -hmm. some people were talking about in the chat, like, I think it was Dandelion who was saying, when she uh, feels like she talks too much in a conversation, she feels embarrassed. She feels bad. It's these yeah. kinds of feelings of shame and embarrassment that uh, can really help us develop like moderation in our behavior. Um, but the don't have that they don't have, they don't have that. And so they can't even reflect on anything. No. And if you've, if you've ever gonna... known one, there's no growth. It's weird. Like if you ever, no a narcissist they they once you're a, you see their behavior clearly you're like oh my god i'm dealing with a six-year-old a, a bratty awful six-year-old in an adult body and then you see him 20 years later and you're like oh my god it's still, still the that. same six-year-old yeah and but now they have gray hair like it's right. really wild there is no emotional or personal growth present so patricia evans talked about that about um they never emerge to like adult reality so they're just kind of stuck in that childhood um stage like you just talked about yeah it's crazy like three-year-old yep tantrums and stuff so and that's and that's anybody really that's not we all kind of go through life thinking that we are the baseline for normal our behavior tends to keep us relatively safe you know, it tends to work up until it's proven that it doesn't work. And it's the same thing with holding on for hope for like an alcoholic or an anorexic or anybody else. I, I mean, I, when I was a nurse, I can't tell you how many people, like all they had to do was take a pill every single day. And they wouldn't. They, they wouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, or you've got to change your diet. You're diabetic. Like you're going to start. And like you're, the pain is so great. You're going to start losing limbs. Like yeah. this is real. This impacts you and nobody else. All you need to do is take your, I know you don't like needles. Nobody does, but do you, do you like your toes? <laughs> because that's where it's going to, that's what we're talking about. So now it's, you know, and, and trying to get through to them and, and, and still, I mean, it's so tragic when you hold some, when you see somebody that's dying and you're with them and it's like, my God, this is so preventable. My, and, my my friend dad is in the hospital now just because mm -hmm. of that he's a diabetic and he just refused to take care of himself and yep. she found yep. him on the floor in a coma yep yeah now, i've known people that are diabetic and they would eat uh sweets and just like a ton and then yeah. they would go take their insulin like, yeah that's, that's not how this that's not how this works at all yep and it's yeah, frustrating because there's nothing <laughs> you can do about it you there's, That's why dealing with codependence is so important. Yeah. So we can act like mature, it's, functional adults. It's a tough realization <laughs> to know that you you can't, no matter what love you give somebody, you can't make anybody no, but it's, it's unless it's, they want to. That's right. It's painful how we can see those things in extreme situation, but like what really we need to see how in every day we actually don't see some of extreme behaviors we mm -hmm. have or are thinking yes that's how you yeah. start dealing with yourself like going like you need to really start looking at how present you are to your own reality i'm trying to bring us back i hope you guys see that <laughs> <laughs> see that I do. <laughs> well, and that's and that's so true because you know it is about being self-protective it is about valuing yourself and and seeing our own 
lack of self-care in certain areas and realize like this is a big deal. And if we can truly shift our focus on to um, what we can control, which is us and realize that like James was saying, our love can't save somebody else. Like they will, they need, you know, to come to that own conclusion. Yeah. And it is really, can be really tragic and heartbreaking. Well, it's hard to own your own reality. Like if, you know, you are born this special child and you have your value, you have your immaturity, you have, you know, all those characteristics of the child. And basically you are made wrong for all of that by your dysfunctional codependent parents. So you cannot own your reality because you are, your reality was being made wrong all the time. Like, you know, yes. that's, that's the, I call, you know, I think we, we she says that too, that that's just basically it's a psychological or or intellectual abuse or sh- I don't remember how she calls that exactly but you can develop you know mature in a healthy way in those kind of codependent, fam- codependent families mm-hmm. right yeah um okay so then point number four she talks about is wants and needs and she categorizes so people that struggle with codependency really have a difficult time with understanding and meeting their wants and needs. And so or even knowing what, what your wants and needs are sometimes. Absolutely. And so she covers that. So the first one is that we're too dependent. So we might know our wants and needs, but we might expect other people to take care of them for us. Yeah. Um, And because we're not able to take care of them ourselves. I would say when people are starting to make this shift into learning to trust again, um, developing healthy trust, this is something that I see people fall into where they're like, boy, I really hope this other person's going to treat me right. I hope they're not going to be an abuser. That expectation. And it's, it's like, I really hope that this other person's going to take care of me. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I get it because I was there too, but guilty too. Yeah. yeah, like, but it's problematic thinking because it's sort of like, okay, but you know what? They're going to act however they're going to act, and time will tell. It's yeah. up to us to be responsible to take care of us, and yeah. and to respond to their behavior accordingly. Well, in the past, I've focused on other people and their needs and their wants so much that you completely, you know, stop taking care of your own wants and needs, you know? So it's, it's tough to break out of that. It is. It is. There's so many, my goodness, like little <laughs> layers yeah, layers and like aha moments. It's kind of like you're Dorothy in the wizard of Oz, you know, you're following this yellow brick road and, <laughs> and hopefully you have good traveling companions, right? People that are, that are with you and they're moving in the same direction. There's so many different ways that you can get knocked off course. And there's so many, little aha moments that you have along the way to make your life work. It's just, it's quite the journey. You know what I discovered? And that's so crazy. We were reading this book now because I, do do you remember when I, I, I I said that I don't have power in my house? Yes. So I had a problem because, you know, I didn't know what, that I didn't pay my electric bill because I thought I'm paying my electric bill, but they weren't providing me with electricity, only gas. But anyway, when my power got disconnected, my first, emotional reaction to us is that no one can know because everyone will be angry with me and I, it, mm-hmm. it was crazy because i realized that my mother and when i was reading this book it was really clear to me my mother if i if i needed something like i came home from school and i don't know i i i didn't do well on some tests or i needed help with my homework it was such a freaking reason to get angry with me like, so I, w- I'm, I literally was trying that if Tonight. I need help, yeah. people are angry with me because I need help. How, how dare I need help? Like, and it's so crazy because I've seen it now. And, I, and it's like, my mom is not the same way now. My mom, she recovered from lots of her issues. She's, mm-hmm. she's still not, she's still not great. Like she, she, she's so unaware of how codependent he is, but I don't think I can even, you know, give her a book to read about it because they'll be too confronting. Like I have no idea how to impact that, but she, she's a different person now. But when she was parenting me, she was dealing with so much stuff that she was one of those parents that if you come to her with a want or a need, she was react with anger and shame me because I think she was 
transferring that shame and anger from her, you know her situation like she needed help but she was ashamed to tell anyone and ask anyone for help so everything was going on me basically it was like and a then, projection mm -hmm. and like remember when she's when pia says more later about how and i think it was in the other book too in um what did we do last time love that, addiction in a love addiction <laughs> when she addiction. says how some of the thing like we have a feelings about reality, what's happening right now, and we have a feeling of feelings of empathy, like you know, we feel for other people, but then we have those pushed on us, you know, through our broken boundaries, feelings from our parents that they did not want to deal with. So I've been walking around in with my in my life with so much freaking shame, and I had no, and it wasn't just based on my history of abuse. Lots of that shame, it makes sense now, was from my mother being ashamed and keeping the secrets of her being abused by my father. So my wants and needs, there was no place for that. So I was someone who was wantless, needless for a while. Like if you ask me, what do you want, I would be like. I just want everyone to be happy. I would say that. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. You're like the peacekeeper. You, you yes. Know. Do not like you feel it's your job to make everybody else happy. <laughs> That's not possible. Yeah. Perfect victim. I swear, I swear to God, like when you are very much conditioned by your codependent parents, you can become such a freaking perfect victim, such an easy target. It's. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the perfect storm. Yes. Right. I mean, if you have no boundaries and you believe commitments forever, and if anything bad happens, it's all your fault. And like, I want you to be happy. <laughs> and you just want to, right. And you just want to keep the peace in your life and you just want to make the other person happy and you think your love can fix them. Like, happy wife, happy life. Happy life. Right. And you right. walk around singing, all I, oh, all I, hate, I need is I love. That da, 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 da. <laughs> right. I agree, James, like that's super toxic. And a lot of these messages are propagated and it's. And a lot of people say it too. They do. Or like, oh, it's, it's up to your wife. You should just let her like make all the decisions. And that's, that's very unhealthy. And it's, it lets somebody that's toxic kind of um, have an easier road. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. Cause then they, you know, I think any manipulative person's going to, to kind of grab on to, uh, whatever, whatever power they, they think they have. And so, yeah, I, I see this a lot with, you know, women will use different techniques than men. And that's one of them, the whole, well, you should just, I should just get to choose everything in the house. Right. And you shouldn't fight me over it. And, you know, happy wife, happy life and this kind of stuff. And it's like, God, it, you know, that's ridiculous. Like he's not a child. <laughs> like he's and you're yeah. not a child. And, and even still, even if he was like, Mm -hmm. you know really like you're gonna pick out everything in your you yeah. know teenager's room like i don't know just stuff like that i i agree with you it bothers me too yeah and i i had a situation once where um she used to like she would have rearranged like entire rooms i would get home and they're completely rearranged so one day i get home from work and she's rearranged everything but my my rocking chair which is like the one place i sit at Mm. She wanted to move it, and there when, I, when I like stood up for myself, it was like she just exploded. Like, how dare you, like, have a problem? You know, have an issue yeah. with me not making all the decisions? Oh my goodness, like, that's not how this works. Yeah, it's fifty-fifty or right. 100, 100 Well, at least it was your wife, my former mother-in-law. She would walk into my house and rearrange things <laughs> in my house. That's. That takes some nerve to very to, happy boundaries over there. <laughs> like that's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. So she mentions there's the two dependent, there's the anti-dependent who may or may not be able to acknowledge that they have wants or needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and oftentimes doesn't ask for help or guidance from others. Uh, needless and wantless. Um, and then getting wants. I love this one so much. Getting wants and needs confused. Oh, so they might know what they want and get it. Um, they might know what they want, but they don't know how to get it. And so they, they confuse these. So the, for example, they might have the need of physical nurturing, but instead they buy food or go shopping mm -hmm. um, or they might drink. There is a whole, there's the whole mother of healthy 
diet, healthy um, nutrition based on that to know what want do you have, what need do you have right now. Like before you go and eat something, you actually ask yourself, do I have a need for food or do I have a need for hack? Like it's a nutritionist something school. My, my friend did that. And it, for me, it was like, whoa, that's crazy because I realized that I've been eating ice cream when I was so lonely. That, can, you, can you send it to me if you find that article or whatever? Yeah, I, I, I can find it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm guilty of that. Like, I'll... We are um, guilty of that. Ice cream me. or chocolate or... Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's really telling when you're aware of that. Um, I've heard that this concept talked about in terms of primary food and secondary food. So primary food is like emotional oh. food. And secondary food is like physical food. And when people are eating out of like boredom or fear or anger or sadness, uh, and it's the same reasons people also drink oftentimes um, or do any type of, of kind of self soothing habit shopping. Um, it makes you feel good in the moment, but it's mm -hmm. not obviously not a, a long, a good long term. Not when you get the bill. Right. <laughs> We're gaining the weight or get a DUI. Yeah. Or uh, trying to get attention, you know, in in a weird way, instead of like asking directly, "Hey, give me a hug," or or can we just talk or something like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I really I really like that, like understanding, getting our wants and needs confused. Um, and mm -hmm. I was thinking, like, you know, it's it's crazy. I mean, oh gosh, I I say it's crazy too often. I'm not gonna say that again. It's, it would be so great if we actually had this kind of conversation with our children, like, hey, there are certain things that you really need in your life. And, you know, like, you know, you have a need for physical touch, you have a need for, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, just needs. And then there are things you want and want. And I like how she make, um, like, gives you access to know the difference between a need and a want. So wants are something that you give it to yourself and it brings you some sort of joy, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what she says. Like, mm -hmm. it just gives you like this boost of happiness or joy for, for a moment. And I was thinking, yeah, that's great to, to, to teach it to our children. There, there are things that will just give them some joy for a moment. And there are needs that they need to have, like primary needs. And, and yeah. I, I, you know, I guess I keep saying, I am such a fan. I really feel like this stuff, understanding, um, you know, like manipulation, understanding boundaries, understanding, like having a core sense of self. Uh, and it can even come from like a more empowered place, like understanding self-care, how to self-esteem, self-worth, um, self-protection. These kinds of things. Moderation. Uh, <laughs> moderation. Moderation. Yes. I'm a major, you're extreme. You know what? When you're adult, you'll be a little bit more moderate. Can you try to act moderately now? <laughs> Well, and but teaching this stuff at a young age and then continuing to have these conversations as the child gets older and in ways that are more and more age appropriate, just mm -hmm. like we do with sex education, mm -hmm. right? Or the ways really that it should be done with sex education because you don't want your kid figuring it out in the backseat of somebody's car. Oh, right? God, I know. So, yeah. I'm eating well, but so I, I've been yeah. my daughter in a very weird way sometimes to be <laughs> uncomfortable with, but God, my mom, she'd give me no nothing Zero. my mom gave me a book and said here if you have any questions come ask, Go ask your father <laughs> nope she said come ask me if you have any questions i yeah. found the porn it. porn magazine somewhere in my mom drawer that was my sexual education <laughs> and i and i found uh condoms and i thought they were balloons so that was another sexual education oh we're real quick <laughs> uh, people are asking about the book for next month and thank you for bringing that up it's the yeah. book we're going to be doing is um the, it's called the mindful path to self-compassion i believe it was rob last night who'd mentioned he read it um, i'll put a link down below that's not a link. That's the title of the book. Hold on. Close. That's close. That's half <laughs> half of it. Let me go to Amazon. The mindful path to self compassion is just. I'm um, I'm so happy. The title makes me happy. 
I, I hope this one's an audio book because I don't. Why did Pia Melody never? Dude, I don't. Unless and it's on her website and it's like forty dollars for a. No, uh, I don't know. She doesn't even have the ebook weird. version. That's what it was like. Ebook people. You would think. Fuck. Yeah, exactly that too. You would think she would want to make it like widely available. Because it is 2018. We have the technology. I know. I just, my guess is that I don't know why her publisher hasn't done that. And I don't know if she's just not into ebooks and audiobooks, but I was, I went through so much hassle to try to get, I ordered this book three times. I have the a used one. It, it didn't show up. The second one, I ordered it and it's, it should be here today. And so then I had to go to the, the mall, right? Then I had to go to the mall. <laughs> And buy a copy, like, what was it, like, last Wednesday or something. They still have oh. bookstores that are... So, so, James, come on. They do. Yes. So and, it, 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 honestly, James, it didn't even dawn on me to go to a bookstore. I was like... I, I was either. I was totally, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. I can't order it from Amazon. What do I do? I called yeah. my library. Yeah. They didn't have it. I went through so much to get this Dang, out. I didn't even think of the library at all. Yeah. Also, is this a different... Um, edition of the book than what you guys are. So. Yes. Yeah. Are I have there any differences edition. or is it the same? That's a good that question. I don't know. Mine doesn't have an edition number on it, but your cover. Mine is revised. This one is. Mine is. Where does it say the edition number? No, we're going to read how you. We're gonna what does the cover that. of yours look like? First, it oh, says look. first edition. Oh, wow. Mine is revised. You have the original, man. Okay, yeah. No, mine is revised and updated. Is yours have the gold cover, Healthy Love? Yep. Yeah, okay. We have the same one. Yeah, but my, I had to buy the used one because the, they were on a back track. Yeah, but it was... Let's Well, let's get back to that. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> this is so much gold in here. God. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to the wants and needs thing. Um so where difficulty meeting our wants and needs comes from is if a parent takes care of a child's every need, then that child becomes dependent. If a parent shames or abuses the child for expressing a need, the child becomes anti-dependent and has trouble reaching out for help as an adult. If a child's needs were ignored or neglected, the child may become wantless and needless as an adult and may not be aware of their wants and needs. If a child's needs were met with wants, as an adult, they may get these two things confused, such as using food, sex, or just stuff in order to feel a sense of reassurance or acceptance. Yeah, I didn't get that one. What do you mean you didn't get it? Number five, difficulty experiencing moderation. So, um, and it comes in a wide variety of ways. So with the body, with thinking, with behavior, and with feelings. And so with the body, it might be a person's dress. Uh, they're either overly sexy or they're overly kind of frumpy. They're Constrained. Baggy clothes, trying to hide kind of stuff. They might be really overweight or really thin. Um, I would say overly seductive or overly frumpy as well. Um, thinking. I'm quiet and loud. Yeah, thinking tends to be either black or white, uh, or um, I guess thinking in general tends to be black or white. Uh, behavior tends to be extremes, like trusting everyone or trusting no one, um, disciplining their children severely or not at all, uh, with boundaries, building fortresses or no boundaries whatsoever. So it's just, it's very extreme. You know, I also thought that that was extreme in my case when I would either not be able to make a decision at all or be very impulsive and just making decision and going with it. That's a great... Yeah. Yes, I, I agree and can relate. Um, okay, number... Let's see, feelings. So feeling little to no emotions or explosive or agonizing ones. And I, I felt that dating a codependent person is or being in a relationship with a codependent person i i said there's like two extreme you either like a dating and ex highly explosive material or a freaking zombie so disconnected from everything <laughs> <laughs> and i was thinking like it's either a zombie 
or a highly explosive material. <laughs> Well, and that's a good, that's another good point you bring up because a lot of people struggle with that. They're like, I'm so used to all of this intensity, the love bombing, the, mm -hmm. you know, the highs and lows, the making up and then the breaking up. And, and, and sometimes the intensity doesn't have making up and breaking up, but a lot of times it does. Mm -hmm. So the opposite of that intensity can feel really flat and leave a person feeling like you're saying, I oh, got this person's just got no personality and, right. and I can't tell if they're interested in me or whatever, when really it's, they're just not super intense. Um, yeah, that moderation kind of doesn't look that inviting sometimes <laughs> in other people. <laughs> I think it depends on how healthy you are. <laughs> no, but I'm saying like when you walk out from this abusive relationship, the first day moderation is really boring and you're like, uh. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think for, for quite a while after an abusive relationship, because when you're so used to, um, you're just confusing intensity with intimacy and intensity with sincerity. And, you know, if you have like a normal person, if something happens and, you know, I don't know, like you say like, okay, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to go to bed or I'm going to, I'm done. They don't text. You don't wake up to like 20 text messages and no. flowers at your front door and them trying to, whatever like apologize or get you back they're like oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> whatever <Wow. laughs> you know? or um if you say like oh i don't i don't want to i'm going to spend time with my friends this weekend a normal person's gonna be like oh okay whereas a narcissist can be who are you with are you cheating on me i need you i love you you're everything yeah. call me when you, before you go out call me when you get back and all of, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. all of that controlling behavior can be mistaken for caring and but when you're far enough out of that, you see it for what it is, and it seriously holds no appeal whatsoever. It's like, oh my god, like this is just it's smothering, it's exhausting, it's immature, it's not there's no lure, like there's no appeal. <laughs> I, I feel that you know how sometimes in a chat we have I mean you have, we have because I'm there, I'm like looking at the chat a lot. Uh -huh. People asking about what it is to take it slow i think we have a hard time taking it slow because yeah. for us it's either all in or all out yeah. and that taking it slow will be that being moderate about what i'm gonna do now how i'm gonna respond like just like just being yeah so either um, zero or a hundred yeah but we go either zero or hundred mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, and th that goes back to, I think our boundary issues, you know, if we're so used to like, I, you know, I get real deep with people real fast, mm -hmm. like the old me, I still struggle with this. I, I do better now, but the old me definitely was like, I'm going to get real deep, real fast. I'm going to totally overshare. My life is an open book. Um, you you want to, you know, I would definitely contribute to creating that whirlwind. And if that whirlwind wasn't there, I felt like something was missing. And I felt like anything else was just small talk, which didn't hold my interest. And now I see that that's a problem and um, it, it's not desirable anymore. And so it's like, okay, real intimacy is developed over time. And it's just, it changes everything. Like when you start setting the pace and you're able to not, to, to be able to share your, your reality appropriately, moderately with other people. Yeah. That book is so, there's so much in it. Yeah. Real quick too. She has, um, she talks about negative control versus positive control and negative control is either when we're trying to control others or we're allowing others to control us. And I really, and our positive control is when we determine our reality, we determine what we think, feel, do or not do. And she gives an example in the book that I really like because it's so subtle that it would fly under the radar of, I think, the vast majority of people out there. And the example she gives is a guy, uh, his name's Jack. Jack is shoveling bark, like he's mulch in his front yard, shoveling mulch. And his neighbor comes over, probably well-intended, says, oh, Jack, you need to sure slow that down. You're going to burn yourself out at the rate you're going. And... Jack says, oh, you know what? I'm fine. I really enjoy the exercise. Uh, you know, have a good weekend. Yeah. 
And so she points out that her, the neighbor is trying to exert negative control, whether the neighbor realizes it or not, he probably doesn't realize it, but he's trying to, to dictate how fast his speed and like how much work he should do. And so it's controlling behavior. It's like and well-intended bad advice. Us. It's well-intended, you know, but yeah, controlling behavior. Controlling behavior, yes. <laughs> and, and so Jack did a good job because he was able to maintain positive control over himself. And he was able to use a functioning internal boundary because he was able to reply calmly and yeah. still say, oh, I've got it. I love the exercise. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm. Versus if the negative control had been there, then Jack and, and a non-functioning internal boundary wasn't present, then Jack might have become angry, defensive, or he might have slowed down his shoveling in order to appease his neighbor. Mm -hmm. I just, that resonated with me so much. I've seen that so, I've been on the receiving end of that kind of stuff for yeah. decades. And now yes. that I see it, because before you try to point it out, even to yourself, and it's like, that seems really mild and petty. But that kind of stuff erodes a person over time like crazy. And you start walking on eggshells over something stupid like shoveling mulch. Yeah. And I'm guilty of it at, at certain times too, though. Um, oh, totally. Not Me like too. all the time, all day, every day, unsolicited advice. But I think probably a lot of people in the chat and. Are, but we are, see it. it it's, that's the difference. Well, that's what we were talking about earlier about the codependent controlling. Mm -hmm. so that's that over, um, it's the un, unwanted advice and it's that uh, knee jerk reaction in order to take care of other people. Oh, you really need to slow down to do this. Oh, you know what? I read this great book. You should really read it. Oh, I I did this. You should do this too. And it's sort of like, please get off my back, you know? And, and, and in a lot of it's just the way we phrase it. So let's say if you did come like this book, fantastic book, that if you wanted, if you're excited about it, and you're like, man, my friend could really benefit from this to call them up and it's changing the approach. Like I just read the most amazing book. I don't know if you'd be interested in this or not, but um, it's a book, Pia Melody, Facing Codependence. Absolutely fantastic. Just thought I'd throw that out there. If you want to borrow my copy, you, you can. But I, I know you're always looking for a good book, but but leaving, they have the option of saying yes or no. It's a subtle it, difference, but... it's But it's huge because it gives yeah. them... <laughs> right, but it, it's a subtle difference, but it you makes all, that. <laughs> all the difference in the world with... Because um, it, it gives them, it allows them their autonomy of saying like, yep. oh, thanks for the, the book recommend. You know, I'm always up for a good book or, oh, it doesn't sound like my cup of tea. Do you remember how she said that before when you just share your reality to share your reality, but you don't have an agenda of influencing someone else's reality? I think it was in the last book by her. Okay. So you, it's the same, like, oh, you, you yep. basically can say, share about the book you've read and you can say, hey, if you want to know more, it's that and that, but you do not share it to make the, you know, to influence them. To read that book you just share it because you you excited about reading the book basically and learning something new yes yes and S sam mentions here he says ah oh, this sounds <laughs> totally like precisely my former co-workers so smothering trying to mother goose me all the time trying to to be uh all the time the common the i want to hide now yeah well but i you know i've had people and i'm sure i've done this too like I, I had a, a coworker who would do stuff like this too. And it made me nuts. And I would refer to her as a, a collie dog because she would, it was well-intended. She was super friendly, but she would literally just try to herd people and would just <laughs> run laps. And it was unrelenting to try to get you to do things her way. And so like when Pia Melody talks about the, the manipulative codependent, I think that's what she's talking about. It's the unrelenting oh you've really got to do this i know you're going to love this so much oh you just really gotta just you know come on <laughs> like it just doesn't stop. it's like it's gonna make her happy that she will do what she wants you to do basically because her wharf and whatever is based and on I, that <laughs> i had a boss like that and uh -huh. he would any little where where you should live how much you should pay how much like everything yep 
and it, it's it is exhausting it is absolutely exhausting you're like dude stop this is my life i got this it's all right okay yeah. it's also exhausting when you are actually on the other end of it and you actually are doing that my friends used to call yeah. me yes mommy because i would mother them around okay that's what i was hiding so i <laughs> i was aware of that and i started working on it but it's it, it was exhausting to me, too, because I felt like I'm responsible for all my friends. <laughs> that's well, yeah. and that's a great that point. You know? you know, and that and that's the beauty. I think of when we realize this is where I start and this is where you end and vice yeah. versa. Right. Like mm -hmm. There's that autonomy and um, the, each person is just this healthy little like sphere. Like we're all mm -hmm. these different spheres floating around. It just takes the pressure off of like, oh, my goodness, I don't need to sit here. Yeah. And stick around and try to and drag dragging that horse to water. Like I don't have to do this, and yeah. I don't have to be the one dragged to water. Yeah, no. you focus your energy on something positive or something that you can control instead. Yeah, you don't have to. Like it's almost like it's not your job to fix someone. It's not your job to guide them. Like mm -hmm. you are like co traveler. Like that's how I feel like. And we just don't have control over it. Like, yeah. even if they want to try to make it your job, um, you know, if they say like, well, I know I can change I, with a good man or woman on by my side. I know it's possible. And I just need you to be there and blah, 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 blah. It's like, hey, you know oh. what? This is not my, not, not my circus, not my monkeys, man. Like, you need to go do, fix, go to therapy, do you, and good luck. But like, I, I can't, I, no, like, I'm not going to stand here no. and go through all that. Then, then Delian just had such a great comment. She said, it's the same way whenever we, we survivors encounter somebody in what we perceive to be an abusive relationship, open the door to the information, but don't push them through it. That is so valid because if you try to push them through it, they may just like stay even longer in a abusive relationship and it's their, it has to be their choice to leave. Yep. Well, and not only that, and this is a great point. This is something that I really try to watch myself with. Like the old me, my old live streams, my old videos, um, I did feel the need. If somebody was like, well, Dana, what should I do? And um, But it was, it was a lot pushier than the new me. And th the downside to that is then if, I, if somebody, if any of us mm -hmm. um, are coming across like, yes, I have all the answers for you first of all, we don't, A, and then B, it cheats them out of the experience of learning how to reclaim their power and realizing that you know, like you have all of the answers deep inside of you. Like my, if anything, my role here or our role here is to help you find that, but you do know deep down inside. And so yeah. like getting them to just get that power back. It's like you've said before in live streams, um, like if you're asking questions, you know the answer. You're just looking for that validation of somebody else agreeing with whatever you think. Yeah, and that it's one of the reasons I do try to. to I probably give a, a much longer answer than people are anticipating, because I want to try to like let's examine this. Because if if we just say like oh this flat out this person's a narcissist right. or yes or no or just very cut or dry things it's it's all of the behaviors that that term points to and it's all of the thinking about boundaries and standards and deal breakers that they are missing if we just condense it down to their narcissist run and it's not really that helpful to them that way no and then if if somebody thinks yeah. like i have all the answers or somebody else has all the answers what happens if that person moves or gets hit by a bus yeah. Right. Like then, then they're back to square one. So it's like, and it, and I guess it just goes back to like healthy boundary formation in general of like empowering other people instead of, um, you know, figuring it all out for them. But again, like we don't even have <laughs> the full context. So us figuring it all out is limited anyhow. Um, so Can I talk a little bit about resentment? Are we not going to talk about it? Uh, you could talk about it, then let's talk about intimacy and the seven stages of feeling of, of no. recovery or the writing exercise at the end. And then okay. I'm okay. Okay. Um, so 
I like the resentment. Like, I have two things to say about resentment, I guess. So I like how she said that um, resentment, so that need to get revenge for what has been done to you, that can only increase shame, pain, and anger. Um, and it's interesting. I was reading it, and I remember I just a couple of days ago listened to this story about two monks, and two, two monks were walking, and they met a very big woman that couldn't cross the river. So they, both of them, they carried the woman across the river, and then the two monks walk away. And while they're walking, one of the monks it keeps saying, "Oh my gosh, that woman was so heavy." oh my God, this woman should lose some weight. Oh my goodness, my back is hurting me. You know, they're walking like this for five next miles and, you know, keeps just blaming this woman for everything he's feeling and just remembering all the time. And then finally, he's like, why are you not complaining about the woman? And the other monk says, well, because I picked her up five miles ago, I crossed, I carry her across the river and then I put her down and I'm not carrying her for the last five miles complaining about her that's why my back is not hurting me so that was for me like I remember how I don't want to say that I had this whole need to get revenge but I had this really huge hunger inside of me for justice Yes. And I was just like waiting for justice to be done because it's unfair, it's unfair, it's unfair, yeah. it's unfair, it's unfair. And it it was just like I was on the slope and I couldn't get out from it. And I have to say that I see clearly now how I was just causing more suffering in my, my life just because I was holding to that. It's, it's, it's that it, ties, it ties into you wanting closure and you're not going to get it from a toxic person. Nope. It, it keeps you from moving on and you healing because you're you're looking back waiting for them to give you closure which is not you'll be waiting forever mm -hmm. yeah and it's the other thing is how she says that that the whole idea of resentment is very, uh, of resentment and wanting revenge is really immature it's a sign of immaturity like it's a it's keeping us in the fantasy of like Something like that. That that that's how it should be. Like oh, the fantasy is that if if you will get revenge on someone, that it will somehow cancel the pain. That's not true. That's not gonna happen. That's the fantasy. And somehow we are raised in that fantasy that you know you can made up for something. But there is no making up for something. You just have to deal with the pain and grow through it and heal it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like. Yeah. Well, I think anger is one is a really uncomfortable emotion and it's one that most of us are not familiar with having. And so when you have such a tremendous overwhelming amount of anger when all these relationships end, a person is really kind of inept at uh how to handle that because they've never really handled I mean if our whole strategy for handling anger and others was people pleasing and ingratiating ourselves and then glossing over and suppressing our own anger, the ending of these relationships, you can't do that. It's so right in front of you. And um, so I think it's, it's a challenge to learn, like, how do I handle such a tremendous amount of anger? And, and what do I do with it? And I do think that feelings of like, wanting revenge and justice are very normal. I think that's a, yeah. a part of like, you know, there is such a thing as righteous anger, but mm -hmm. I agree with you, like I'm thinking that if I can hurt them as much as they hurt me, then I won't be hurt anymore. Like th that's a logical fallacy. Like that's not mm -hmm. accurate. It well, feels that way, but it's not. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's illusion. Yeah. I like when later she describes the right, like the, not the right, but the function, the function of emotions when they are in a healthy way and anger is, is this it gives you the strength you need to do what is necessary to take care of yourself, to assert yourself, to be who you are. Healthy anger is helping you to act in your own best interest. Yes, I, I like that too. I'm glad you mentioned that because I had, didn't have that in my notes. Um, she had talked about, you know, all, and I'm such a huge believer in this. Like mm -hmm. our emotions are there because they're signals, they're mm -hmm. action signals. Mm -hmm. And anger is such an important emotion because it lets us know when we need to take some sort of action, there's so much energy in anger. And if we can direct it in a positive direction, it's, it's like rocket fuel. 
and it can really take a person to the next level. Um, but she also talks about, you know, shame that there's no, and I, I, I just, I think she's so right on Like, there's no such thing as a like bad or good emotions. It's no. just whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable. Do you and, want to read that? I, I have, I have in my notes that qu quick messages about the emotion that will be quick. And I think it's very v valid. Sure. Do do okay. Quick? Okay. So joy mm -hmm. is hope and sense of abundance and that you are enough. Uh, passion, energy, and motivation to create and survive. Love, sense of warmth for self and another, motivation to treat yourself and others with kindness and gives you sense of inherited worth. Anger, like I said, is healthy, help, helping us to act in our best interest and to protect yourself. Fear helps you to protect yourself too. Pain motivates growth, increasing maturity. Normal healthy life is full of pain inducing problems. Pain is not equal of suffering. Repressing pain keeps you injured, stops you healing and, mat and from maturing. Guilt, there is a healthy guilt, is used to tell you when you have transgress transgressed a value you consider important. Shame gives you sense of humility and embarrassment and lets you know you have flaws and you are not higher power so we all fart and burp and that you know we feel shame so feeling shouldn't be considered as good and bad or as bad and it's important to know what is the difference between shame and guilt and if you are raised in a functional nurturing environment with parents they will actually teach you that about your feelings otherwise they are being twisted and yes and, uh, and I like how she, well, we talked about this before too, but like the carried emotions. So if a child is on the receiving end of really strong emotions and they're internalizing that, if a parent is acting in a way that's shameless, like an abuser, mm -hmm. uh, if they're not taking any accountability for their behavior, then the child is going to be the one that carries that shame or that guilt for them, thinking that I must be wrong or bad. And... Um, are the secrets when we play out our parents' secrets? That's mm -hmm. crazy for me too. Oh. So let's go down to the um, a, a, another core factor of codependence is that it basically boils down to when if these symptoms, if these core areas don't get in alignment, um, we have an impaired ability to sustain intimacy, which makes total sense because. If a person doesn't have that a healthy self-love, self-worth, self-protection, um, self-awareness, um, all of these things, they're not able to be fully present in their reality. And the only way for us to truly have intimacy with another person, intimacy is that sharing, that authentic sharing of our reality with another person. And so... Um, it's learning to get in tune with our self-esteem and our boundaries and our wants and needs and to be able to assert ourselves and all of it. So she does, she has an exercise here at the end um, that I thought was really fantastic. And she said uh, to write down, uh, she says recovery involves facing the existence of less than nurturing experiences in our childhood and then getting the history straight. Yeah, I, 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 I love that. So it's a second step. First step, she says, you have to just admit that you are codependent. And the second step is you facing all the history of abuse. And I think that is what's supposed to provide you with clarity of what are your feelings now as an adult about your life and what are all those current feelings from the trauma you have experienced mm -hmm. or from your parents that, you know, that they transferred on you. Like just gaining that clarity it's, she says it's almost like putting a code into the program that we're just, you know, open something up and you, you, you will be functioning on a different level, basically having. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It's awareness, mm -hmm. right? Like that's the piece of the puzzle that, you know, so many of us have been missing. So I like how she says that recovery involves facing the existence of less than nurturing experiences in our childhood. So for a lot of people that haven't experienced like horrific abuse or neglect as a child, it can be really confusing because, and she talks about this in, in these different steps, but 
if we're not looking at abuse or neglect, we're looking at less than nurturing mm-hmm. because less right. anything that's less than nurturing is going to have Enough. negative consequences and a person can get out of alignment just from less than nurturing. And so this isn't about blaming. It's not about staying stuck. It's not about any of this. It's about it just acknowledging Let's just explore these. We don't have to explore these experiences with judgment. We can explore them with curiosity of kind of what's going on with me now. So once we can acknowledge, boy, you know what? These were some less than nurturing experiences. Um, and, And then we can start getting the history straight. So we can start seeing the history of this through our adult, our functional adult set of eyes instead of the, the child Mm-hmm. our wounded inner child who might be um, carrying guilt or shame or trying to be protective of the parent. Um, you know, so like it's, it's wild. I, it's just so powerful when you start realizing um, and not minimizing your reality. And I, we'll, we'll go through the steps because this is one of the steps. And I think it's so, so, so critical. So number one, she says, look at each year of your life from birth to age 17. Mm -hmm. Identify any experiences of abuse and who did them to you. I would also add any experiences of less than nurturing parenting. Anything that sticks out as significant to you as a significant moment of that you felt embarrassment, shame, um, guilt, or less than. Mm -hmm. Whether or not they intended it or not. And just, start with what you remember, because you don't need yeah. to remember everything at once. Right. right. And then she says, do not focus on whether the person meant to hurt you or not. And That's then, so important to me. I'm sorry. It is. Yeah. It is. There's, there's, I, there's a couple of experiences in my life um, that I, I, oh man, talk about good intentions gone wrong. <laughs> just real quick. There was a little girl I used to babysit for obviously 30 years ago. And this was when Chili's or Applebee's started doing that thing where they would come out and they'd sing happy birthday to you. Mm -hmm. Like restaurants weren't doing, like that was a new thing back in the eighties. And so I convinced my dad, I'm like, let's, I think it'd be so much fun. Like, let's take her out for her birthday and have everybody sing happy birthday to her. And so my intention was that it would be this really fun moment. And she, this little girl starts crying. She was horrified because she was, all the attention was on her. I felt freaking awful. Um, So like these moments that might've been really pivotal and like, you know, destructive to her, that totally was not my intention at all, but that might've really shaped, caused all kinds of weird things you know what i mean like talking to a mother do you know how many awkward things i did they were very very well intended i took my daughter one time to the movie that was inappropriate it was so freaking scary we had to walk away because she was crying what movie was it (laughs) it was like a haunted house like a cartoon and i thought it was such a great movie because it was described as funny but it was scary she was like five and she was crying (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think things like that. Um, that's another example of that was when I was a kid, my dad and my brother liked all of the old horror movies, and like Bella Lugosi and, you know, the old Frank and black and white horror movies. I, they terrified me and they thought it was so well, and here's an even better, I'll get this. I was terrified as a kid and they would always tease me about it. Well, then fast forward, my brother was probably nine or 10 and he saw the blob. And he was terrified by that movie, terrified. And my parents, I mean, ridiculously terrified. It was fantastic for me because I could crawl along the floor pretending to be the blob and he would start screaming and crying, (laughs) but it was awful for him. And (laughs) And then at one point, my dad explains to him that the blob is jelly. It's grape jelly. My brother develops (laughs) this total fear aversion of fear of grape jelly what and- <laughs> fear. okay let me make fear of grape jelly <laughs> yes so but you know I don't mean to laugh at you. like so like these are like more mild things right but they i these things it's the mild stuff too that can really it's be amazing. traumatic and like it can shape a person and um 
Does he still hate grape jelly? I'll have to ask him. He's <laughs> Mr. Fitness, so he probably hasn't had jellies. He probably hasn't had jelly since he's been nine. He probably didn't even have grapes, so grapes are such a high index sugar. Like avoids the, the grape jelly aisle. <laughs> he probably, he <laughs> might. might. Poor he's, we're all I there. know, I know. What a terrible sister I was. <laughs> but, but you know, yeah. stuff like that really is, you know, it goes back to like, we thought it was funny. He didn't. And we just yeah. kept at it. So like mm-hmm. boundary kind of stuff. And then not realizing um i don't know all of the different ways that that things can be really traumatic like here's another example that was not intended so i had a friend of mine that was going to a um performing arts school junior high maybe high school i don't even remember and i really wanted to go with her well i don't do any arts i don't play an instrument i don't dance i don't do art um and for some reason, my mother was like, oh, yeah, you should go audition. I had like, I don't even know, a few piano classes. Needless to say, I did not get in. Uh, all of the kids there, of course, were like performing arts students, right? I was horrified, mortified. And everybody was just staring at me like, what are you doing here? Right? Understandably so. Like, I don't think my mom set me up to fail. I just don't think she had any clue as to like what the school was or like what I really needed to do to get in. But that stuck with me like so much that that feeling of just being so, I mean, talk about shame and embarrassment, you know? So like all of these little events, well intended or not, impact us. how it shapes you. Gosh, yeah. oh, is so. Anyway, so she talks about these different writing down. I would say less than nurturing experiences in general, um, and then don't focus on whether or not the person meant to hurt you. But um, you can hold these people accountable, but this is not about blame. It's I about that. yes. It's just about acknowledging, like, because sometimes with these events that we're talking about, you know, it can feel like, oh man. Like, I don't want to be upset with my mom. Like, she didn't know better, you know. But acknowledging, like, you know what? This was the result of this event, even though she didn't mean for this to happen. Like, this still really impacted me. You only um, validate your own internal work of what happened. That's all you're doing. Thank you. That's a great way to say that. It's exactly what it is. It's just validating that this happened and it negatively impacted mm-hmm. you in some way. And then oh, she yeah. says, Are you right? Um, mm-hmm. She says, do not compare your past with others doing so your pain and this is so true even if a person has gone through horrific abuse because it's like oh you know like oh well i feel really bad i um i don't know something my father screamed and yelled at us and then somebody else's father hit them and then it's sort of like well i guess i have nothing to complain about like at least i wasn't getting hit yeah right when it's about it's about the same basically yeah, pain Doesn't is pain. Matter. Just comparing or it. Yeah, pain is pain, and and seeing it for what it is, and just acknowledging it. You know, I mean, um, yeah. And then she says, then describe the behavior in terms of functional or dysfunctional, instead of good, bad, right, wrong. So, and then focus on focus on what happened to you in terms of your caregivers, not in terms of you being a caregiver. Uh, that was a good thing for me because I was so guilt tripping myself in this book. <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to focus on down the road, like the ways that this behavior has yeah. come out onto our children so we can acknowledge it and validate it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think they learn by example the best and we it it's more helpful if we can stop what we're doing that's if no, i shouldn't say if we can get more into alignment with well, ourselves if, if i guilt trip myself about that what i'm gonna do is just induce more guilt on my daughter basically right right it doesn't solve anything yeah, it's not gonna solve anything yep. yeah right um and yeah i guess that was pretty much um now i, I- I'm just going to go back to why blaming is not really working. And I, 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 she, she, she just picture like blaming is like putting your handcuffs. Um, it's like hand, handcuffing yourself to your abusers. So if you're blaming the abuser, you're actually giving your, them control over your life. You're giving them power. 
And um, that's why this exercise is focused on you just validating your own experience of what happened for you so we can move on. You want to use it to work and free yourself from from those negative experiences. Yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, I think understanding like how to actually function, you know, process emotions and um, to move forward from, again, this stuff is not talked about. <laughs> like how to move forward from it, how to heal from it, what it is, like none, none of this is talked about. And so I think under, feel if a person feels like they did this to me, right? Like they, they're feeling those feelings of blame or they're feeling um, like they want revenge. I think so many of these are totally normal feelings until a person learns like, cause that's such an, that's such an, an awful, I don't think anybody wants to be caught up in like blame or revenge mode because it is so powerless, but mm -hmm. I think it's like, they don't know what else to do. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do with all of this anger? Like this happened to me, this person violated me, they abused me. I, I don't want this to rule my life, but I don't know how to let, how to make it stop, you know? And so understanding that, um, the, the, instead of blame, like the, the next step, like we can acknowledge it. Yes. What happened to you was not right. And it was not fair and it was disgusting and it was wrong on every level. And it's okay to feel how you feel, but we can take this. And instead of focusing, instead of staying there and blame, we can take this and use this as a building block to validate your pain. And now we can, there is life after this, like we can start yeah. moving past this and um, seeing, acknowledging, like, how did this event truly impact me on all of these different levels and starting to work through these different levels so you can get back into that alignment with your healthy self so mm -hmm. you can move forward and and live a good life. Oh, yeah. And you know? just by, just if you get yourself those, that validation, you know, first you start with yourself validating your experience, then you can have a therapist validate your experience or some closer friends. Yeah. That will remove lots of, lots of anger because lots of anger comes from no one sees it. No one protected me. No one gets it. No one understands me. Like when you are so alone in your own experience and you feel that even having that experience is being wronged by other people that's main main cause for the anger mm. so yeah. get that validation give it to yourself first and um i mean i don't want to say that i'm grateful for being abused in my past but the crazy thing here is that i'm sort of am because what i am right now it's like I, like i really embrace my whole life like i wouldn't change anything in my life and like, I don't want to say I'm grateful for it, but I'm okay with everything that happened because I used it to really grow. And Pia says in this book, and I think in other books too, how, you know, if you if you grow through your pain and you actually get to this place when you start feeling perfectly imperfect and there is like this pain and joy are really connected together and you're really discovering your like the intimate connection with yourself with your higher power or god or whatever or the universe mm -hmm. if you or or i don't know but what's what's the equ equivalent of that in a buddhist i i don't know that peace maybe i don't know but you really can experience this wonderful awareness of being this wonderful human and i don't know i just think that's just such a great place to be in be at like dealing yeah. i rather deal with codependency that never got through it and never really experienced you know the true awareness of being alive right i don't know right yeah and it shapes who you are as a person and, and i think that's cool and it's um it makes you unique yeah and it allows it's that doorway that opens um i think that's the beauty and the power of pain mm -hmm. is that's the power of rock bottom like that that's just um, it's almost a, I, I really view that that pain of rock bottom as like a sacred space mm -hmm. that we're only at um, a, a few times in life and there's so much awareness it's like this the pain of rock bottom allows us <coughs> to question things and to do start doing things different and um, I really feel like if people don't have that pain of rock bottom of having their whole life blown apart a lot of, I think a lot of people just go through life with lives of kind of this quiet desperation. Like yeah. Thor I think it was Henry Thoreau said once. Um, and, but when you have things so shaken up, you're like, oh my gosh, you start questioning everything. And you're like, oh my gosh, like 
it was my family that was I got a bunch of messed up messages from them and then from society and then from all kinds of people. And you start questioning everything and reintegrating everything into yourself and into a way that this new cohesive whole is so much stronger and wiser than before. And when you get to that place, I think I agree with you, healthy love. Like you're like, Oh my goodness. uh, I would have never gotten here had I not experienced so much pain. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like part of the journey. Yeah. Yeah. It's necessary. You know how there's no no pain, no gain t shirts? I almost want to say no pain, no growth. <laughs> like, I so love I that. I I think you should totally, I I should totally do, do that. Like a painting and, we, and you can put it on a shirt. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I want to do a shirt. No pain, no growth. Like, seriously. There I will go. order. Well, James and I are going to order some from you. I would totally order at least five. <laughs> Girl, Off of made- Amazon Prime. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not on Amazon Prime, I'm not ordering. It's not happening. Yeah. That's the only way. Maybe <laughs> that needs to put on Amazon Prime. <laughs> I I do I love I love that because it is so um, yeah absolutely right on and I think that's and then co- the cool thing too is I think when a person does get to this level where they start in in PM Melody talks about this too with healing is it's it's not such a, a cut and dry line. It's um, no. we're in recovery when we're practicing different ways of being, when we're practicing, uh, you know, a more solid state of self-esteem, being more moderate, um, you know, you, having healthier boundaries, then we're, we're acting, we're coming from a place of recovery. And, um, and then there's going to be times where we slip into our old ways of being, and then we're not in recovery. We're acting out these kind of codependent habits and we go back and forth and it's just kind of this um, imperfect journey into self-actualization and into this healthy life. And um, it's just so cool. Like, cause then you start, I mean, my goodness, like the, I just, one of the biggest kicks I get out of this whole channel is you just start meeting all of these other like fellow travelers on the path. Yeah. You know? And it's like, where have you guys been all my life? Like, it's right. just, I heard the same <laughs> <laughs> it's so cool like, my like did you think exist whenever this was like first started or yeah. <laughs> it would have been nice if it, I know. the yeah. internet or any of this would have existed Save a lot of money right it, well i i think my healing would be on a completely different level if i had access to community like this when i was just dealing with that it's been like what six seven years or or eight almost eight years alone basically and just and not being validated so i get all the anger and stuff but when you you know when you start go like when you're starting finding yourself more on that other side of it like even just having those moments embrace it because you're gonna have more and more and more of those moments and yeah and i think you almost get used to living your life in the state of like perpetual introspection and, and growth. Growth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, like I said earlier, like I had this aha moment yesterday about, oh my gosh, like I feel like I didn't realize perfectionism had been such a driving force in my life. I wasn't concerned about doing things perfect. I was just concerned about doing them right. And I wasn't even thinking I was mm-hmm. doing them right or a fear of failure and stuff. And like you have these these realizations that come up and it just really kind of scrambles your world view again because it you all of a sudden all the pieces rearrange and yeah. um but it's so powerful and you have these aha moments and then once you have them you can't unhave them and your life is forever changed and you just kind of level up and you're like oh my goodness i see so much of my problematic behavior clearly and now that i i can i am in tune with it i can actually start doing something differently about it Mm-hmm. Instead of just feeling anxious and depressed and not knowing why or misdirecting it and thinking, oh, it's because of um, I just need better workflow or time <laughs> management. And it's like, no, that's not it. Nope. You know, no, the, it's uh, so since we're not going to have PMLD next book, maybe, you know, for a while, we're not going to talk about her. Let me just say my favorite thing about PMLD books yes. is that she really connects that spirituality and like the way she explains 
Oh my goodness. It's like, I feel so special being a human being when I, after reading Pia's book, because I feel all those different dimensions of me, like my feelings. And like, there is almost this magic that I can feel someone else's feelings when they're trying to hide them from me. Or like, I'm leaving up my mother's secret that she hid from me. Like, I felt how freaking wonderfully human are that, it, you know, it's, that that's that's a that's a fact like this is happening like in in the past i would think like oh, oh, oh no way like i live my life i made the wrong decisions it's i'm responsible for all of that but now like i was sharing with my friend today on the phone like i literally lived my mother's secret i did exactly what my mother was hiding from me exactly like it was just like if you put those two stories next to each other it's like they would be so freaking aligned and i was like wow pia really discovered all those different dimensions about being human the yeah. spirituality your uh, emotions and the boundaries and that there's just so like and why the boundaries are so important because you are more than here this is like you have to know where you end and and when you start and begin actually you have to know what you are responsible for you have to know what, what how you hold yourself because you are connected. You are so connected with every other human being. You can feel their emotion. Uh, you can you can leave their secrets. They can leave your secrets. So you really want to be this our human being because there's just so much more at stake than just you, basically. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's well, amazing. I, you know, I, I've I've always been a big fan of like the purpose of life is to grow. Yeah, it's, it's to evolve, right? Like that's what we're all doing. All these different species are doing. And as humans, it's our job to basically like run the ball down the field, you know, and we each have our own um, kind of special song that we sing. So everybody's running their ball down the field in, in their own certain area. And it's mm -hmm. just about becoming like the highest and best version of yourself, not what society tells you to be, not what your parents tell you to be not any of that, like really getting in tune with like who you are and in expressing that in the highest and best way. I went Polish. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you would get real close and then like back up. It was awesome though. It really drives the, the plan. It's not, a, it's not a bad thing. Someone says they dying to read Pia book melody. It's it those book are good, but they are pretty difficult. Like I read them within the last few days because I couldn't get this freaking book on time. So it was too much yeah. for me. Like and there's so much gold in it. I don't think we are able to pull out like fifty percent out of it today. I agree. There's so, so much. So here. much. In yeah. these books. And and just to be clear for people that are fresh out of this or you're yeah. kind of beginning to explore all of this, um, this is not to say that you are somehow responsible for what happened, that you're responsible for the abuse, that you could have changed things, that um, even though we're talking about codependent behavior and kind of being out of alignment and these kinds of things, it's uh, please know that you didn't cause or do anything that happened to you. So it, this is about becoming like the... Um, you know, the healthiest version of us and to stop getting tangled up with abusers and learning how to see this stuff um, for what it is. Well, and it's about owning your part and then kind of moving on from it and start. Yeah. It's well, also not a good book for people that are fresh out or still. No, <laughs> please do not do it to yourself. Triggering. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think, and it's okay. Like, and this is a book if you are fresh out and you're still you're just needing that that validation component i think there's definitely a time and place for being angry for being hurt and for feeling victimized like it's okay like, if that's where you are that's where you are and um in time when you're ready to explore like bound healthy boundaries standards and deal breakers and um all of this i would encourage you to read this book at that time mm -hmm. And it yeah, might I even feel like most people would have a good sense of like when they're ready to, mm -hmm. to jump into it. Yeah. Cause I, I don't think I would have sought out a book like that. It would have taken me a handful of years yeah. mm -hmm. to get to the place where I was ready to even be open to this. I just did not understand how 
um, my boundary standards or deal breakers played into any of what I was, what I got involved with. I didn't know what boundaries are. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I, I spent so much time reading like all kinds of books about toxic people and narcissists and stuff that I never, I didn't even really hear the word codependent until I don't even remember like months later. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read like nothing. My, sorry, my brain was not functioning for me to read anything at yeah. some point. And well, because you're so, still dealing with the um, CPT is the whatever we call that, yeah. Cognitive dissonance. Is that what? You're uh, no, I was just I was dealing with psychotic breakdown first. Like I didn't know what my name was, so I couldn't read anything. To be honest with you, wow. The first thing I read, to be, in all honesty, was the freaking Bible, and I just read like Psalms because that was just to it's a good place to start it that's is a good place like that. To yeah and i was listening to joyce mayer i remember that that's like easy very easy stuff i was in the wink yeah i like her because she's like pm melody she's pretty direct um <laughs> they even look the same they even kind of do i agree yeah. Yeah. i was like they kind of look the same yeah i have to disagree with that but it's okay. <laughs> well they both i think have that kind of no nonsense look about yeah. them and um, they both strike me as very strong women. And um, yeah, you know, the, the codependency thing for me, I didn't identify with it because I had holes in my boundaries. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have no, I didn't, it's not like I didn't have any boundaries. So I was like, I don't see how this doesn't apply to me. Um, Could you even say that then? Like, isn't that just now in a hindsight? Because I, I honestly, I didn't know I had any problem with boundaries because boundaries was like non-existent conversation, like idea. Well, to me, man. You don't know what you don't know. So it's yeah. like, you never well, um, had them to miss them. So it's, it's kind of, it makes it difficult. I mean, I guess like I used to teach this stuff. So oh, like, God. I, like I knew about boundaries and I knew about. They didn't teach me that on my That's university. So <laughs> well, I, I learned all of this when I was working I mean, I, I, my parent, my mom has always been a huge fan mm -hmm. of therapy. We were in and out of therapy for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they divorced, we went through a lot of therapy. And so there was talk, but I just, I, I don't think I even gained anything out of all that, to be honest with you. It was nice to talk to somebody, but mm -hmm. outside of like, like the psychoeducational component, I didn't get, it really wasn't until I was working at the domestic violence shelter and like having to teach structured classes on a wide variety of topics that I understood this, but even still like, well, I it could just only goes to show how covert it can be. Oh, totally. And you can only teach something from your point of understanding. Right. So I, like, I didn't have, there were holes in my knowledge and there were holes in my own, obviously my own application of that knowledge. And so, um, yeah, it was a horrifying feeling on many different levels to realize, like, I have, I've only been teaching 20% of, of what people, not even that, probably, probably closer to 5% of what people actually need in order to, to learn this stuff, because PM Melody just nails it. It really is these different areas, and, like, learning how to be self-protective and boundaries. So, I had always thought about boundaries in terms of, like, being assertive and saying no. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really thought about it in terms of like self-protection and like walking away from situations that don't, that aren't nourishing or especially if they're abusive or cause you all kinds of mental anguish, you know? Um, For me, I, but like the, the whole idea of the boundary that I only um, like react to the uh, opinions or feelings or whatever or words that are true to me like you know that i can be selective yes that, that's huge. Like, that is boundary like <clears throat> i had no idea i thought they have to take in everything that people were telling to me telling me and that if i have oh and if i don't that means i'm not a sensitive person that's what i thought yeah you know it's interesting about that one like i um I very distinctly, I, I was working at a, a youth home. This was 20 something years ago. And there was a gal there um, that had been uh, molested by her high school coach. And he had molested a lot of girls. And anyways, she was getting teased by other kids about what had happened. 
and um and about her fam her fam her parents were hippies and like kids were teasing her about her family and all kinds of stuff and i remember having a discussion with her because i thought it was so strange that she was just um accepting everything that they were saying and i and i couldn't understand that at the time because i was like well but what they're saying isn't accurate like that's not true like that's not what happened that's not who you are that's not who your family is like they're wrong like you don't need to own any of that and but it was just because they'd said it she totally internalized it and it was all of a sudden her truth and then reading this book so fast forward 20 something years right um reading this book and it's like oh my gosh i because I, I don't think i necessarily had that issue and so mm-hmm. then seeing, oh my gosh, there's people out there that when other people say ugly, awful, hurtful things, they totally internalize it mm-hmm. um, and, and accept it as truth. So that was really eye-opening um, for me. And I think that'll help me to um, do what I do. What I do so. how, how, how are we going to end this? <laughs> because there's so much to find. I know. Well, I think I think we should just end it because we're going three on three hours. hours. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> just end this, end this, end that. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. So let's recap the book. The book next month is going to be um, The Mindful Path to Self-Compassion by Christopher Gurner. Gurner, I believe. And um, yes, that's the book. So book club is the last Thursday of every month, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We hope that you guys join us. I'll be posting my notes on this book here within like the next week. So thank you guys so much for joining me. Thank you, James. Healthy love. I really appreciate all of your input and uh, yeah. everything. Just was awesome. Thank you for letting us join you. <laughs> and very enjoyable. So okay, <laughs> yes, lots of love. behind you. <laughs> yes. Lots of love to you. You're not alone. You are not crazy. And you can move forward and heal from this. So Thank take care. You. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you the best. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.